Say thank you for everybody coming down. We'll go ahead and call the order of the Metropolitan Planning Commission October 27th, 2022 meeting to order. Appreciate everybody coming down and the commissioners. Thank you on this beautiful fall day. Um, our first part of the agenda, bef but before we get started, just a few housekeeping idea, um, items is to first, if everybody just put their phone on um, silent mode, that would be great. And then also commissioners on the microphones, um, since sometimes we're always having issues with sound, but um, the, the team will um, turn your microphone on, so just be patient for when you're speaking, and then we'll, I'll call your name, and then we'll turn the microphone on. So, um, so we are on to item B, which is adoption of the agenda, and commissioners, the agenda was sent out prior and posted publicly. Is there a motion to adopt the agenda? No. That's a proper motion. Second. Second. Any other discussion? Seeing none. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Ayes have it, and the agenda is adopted. Next is the approval of the October 6th, 2022, and the October 13th, 2022 minutes. And those were also sent out earlier um, and posted, and we'll need a motion to approve those minutes. Is there a motion? It's a proper motion. Second. Any other discussion? Edits or additions? All right. Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Ayes have it. And those two minutes are adopted. So now we are on to the recognition of the council members. And I, we just take these as, as I see you um, come into the room. And so first was um, Council Lady Hauser. Do you want to go now? Come on up. Yeah. Hold my hand up before everyone. Okay, no problem. Thank you, Council Lady. Appreciate you coming down. Uh, then I saw Councilman Hall. Hello. Oh, yeah, and, and it, we need to, you, if Councilman, um, that microphone, right? Yeah, yeah, right there, that way. It picks up better. Thank you, thank you, thank you. As always, appreciate you guys' service. I'll be really quickly. Um, I've got three items this evening. Um, I believe six and seven, which are recommended for a deferral, which is perfect because it allows us to do another community meeting. And then I've got 31 A and B, which potentially in my lifetime is probably the single best thing that you will see have done, been done in my district. And so we're extremely excited about it. It's recommended for approval and um, we're just excited to see that come to fruition. Thank you, Councilman. Appreciate Thanks, you guys. coming down. Good to see you. All right, next I saw Councilman Syracuse. Where's he at? There he is. Hello, Council. All right. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Commissioners, Councilman. Good to see everybody. I am here to talk about uh, item number 23 on your agenda, looking to apply a contextual overlay district. Um, so a couple of my neighborhoods, my post-World War II, 1950s, 60s neighborhoods, have been having discussions about what the appropriate level of preservation is of them, trying to be proactive. We have had one very odd three-story addition to, to one of the homes, and as we know, base zoning allows anybody to go three stories. Um, but our post-World War II neighborhoods are largely uh, ranches. Some have added a second story. Some, um, a couple few, have knocked it down and built a two-story house. Um, so there's not really tools in the toolbox that look at our post-World War II neighborhoods, so to speak. And uh, the only tool in the toolbox was a contextual overlay. And so we we looked at that. We've talked about that. We've applied it to, to uh, homes homes in the neighborhood, and we've had three meetings now in the Lincoya Hills uh, neighborhood re regarding this. In a nutshell, this tool um, is kind of a square peg in a round hole. It was made really for smaller lots, not for Donaldson lots that are larger. Um, but the conversation was about, well, what is that pragmatic level of preservation? Um, so what I would like to do here is ask you all to go ahead and approve it, but I wanted to come here and go on on record to say that what I do have coming before you is a very simple two-story overlay. What is weird is that third story. When you add that, that third story option, then the design uh, becomes problematic 
and it doesn't fit within the neighborhood. When you do two stories, they're going to be it's going to be a pitch roof. It, it will fit in. So, in in talking to neighbors, there was a good kumbaya moment where the two story overlay is something that everybody would 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 like to see. And so, but. The, sc the stop gap measure is to go ahead and pass it here so it becomes pending legislation. Uh, the two-story overlay is something that will probably come to you around February or so. Um, and uh, at, at that time, I do intend on killing it, at killing the contextual overlay at council. So I wanted to come here and, uh, and, and let you know that that is the plan, but ultimately to ask for you to go ahead and approve it now and that I'll be back with a uh, potential new tool that really does apply to our post-World War II neighborhoods. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. All right. I saw Councilor Murphy. Where did she go? Hello, Councilor. Hello. We had a council member traffic jam over there. Um, thank you so much for recognizing me. I'm going to get in and out because you have plenty of things to talk about, and I'm sure you're very happy I'm taking 35 pages off of your agenda, I think. Um, so I am just here to touch base on my tree preservation legislation. The process of that bill started summer of... 2021, after I left y'all, um, is when I took a breather and then we got down to work looking at the tree code um, and some housekeeping pieces and some updates. And I would love to claim um, creativity here, but I'm going to claim plagiarism. We basically looked at other counties and other cities and what they do well and copycatted that because we wanted to find things that are already in practice, things that we know work and that we could ask for assistance and processes and procedures from other places so we could upgrade our tree preservation um, code and really fulfill parts of Nashville Next and Livable Nashville because I think one thing that we've all heard um, here and then as council members is that we make these plans but we don't always follow through with policies to put in place or legislation. So that process took quite a bit of time because um, as you know earlier this year the code was reorganized um, and so we had to rewrite um, a pretty large bill and as of last week I want to really thank the planning staff on behalf of the advocates and my seven co-sponsors on this legislation legislation that staff really pulled it together in helping us get the substitute um, in line with where we'd like to see change occur and some topics that probably need a little bit more discussion and examination. So now that we have the substitute, we will be holding stakeholder meetings with other organizations. I know you've been contacted by some. Some of those have already been in communication with me, contrary to some of their letters. I have have um, been talking with them and saying this is coming down the pike, here's our timeline, we've got to get the bill in order, otherwise we're all going to be talking about different pieces, right? I wanted one piece of legislation that we could work off on the same sheet. So now that we're at that point, I'm going to be holding those meetings over the next two and three weeks. That also gives us time to have a work session with y'all because I know it is confusing to have kind of a, a bill that jumps or, or it appears to jump around the code and make changes. So um, we'll get that on your calendar soon. Uh, and with holidays and everything, and I think we heard yesterday at council we're going to have, what is it, Councilman, where there's 12, 12 extra council meetings in 45 days. So... Uh, Y'all are my priority on trees, though. Don't worry. Councilman Withers can worry about the Titans. Um, and so we'll get this, we'll get it all scheduled um, and, and make sure everybody has a seat at the table, and I'll come back to you in December with it. I think that gives us enough time, right, Director, to for y'all to have a work session as well. We have not scheduled the work session yet, but I'll be working with the chairman and the other uh, folks to make sure we get that accomplished. And so I think that gives us enough time. So so I think in the staff report it says November, but but we are deferring to December just because with that, with those 12 meetings that um, Brett is forcing us to have, uh, we want to make sure we, we have time for this. So um, meanwhile, have fun, and I will see you all in two months. Thank you, Council. And um, we are, I, I've talked to the director and we're going to make every effort to meet the timeline um, but 
you know, with the holidays, sometimes it's a little harder. If we, I just want you to know, we're going to make every effort to try to meet that timeline. Yes, and I also want to let you know what we are engaging and what is helpful about doing the two the two meeting deferrals is that um, we we either have or are in the process of engaging a third party landscape architect to kind of do the same way that we require all of these developments to do a traffic study. I thought that it would be fair to have a third party kind of do a few case studies to present that so it would be kind of everybody has fair examples and nobody is cherry picking from extreme. Dreams. So thank you all and have a good evening. Thank you, Council Lady. Appreciate it. Next, I saw Councilman Cash. Come on up. Welcome. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, uh, my item on today's agenda is number 21, an amendment to the um, Primrose UDO. It should be fairly simple. Uh, just some clarifying language to the Premier, Primrose UDO. Um, there were a couple of houses being built in the in the over in the. Um, area, uh, and there was some ambiguity about how to measure and how, how we measure the eave heights and, you know, how it affects the high, overall height of the house. Um, and so uh, staff uh, suggested some clarifying language. Um, uh, we had a community meeting with some good suggestions, hence you all have an amendment to look at tonight. Um, I think it's, uh, uh, we'll clarify how to measure and, and what the height of the uh, homes in the in this overlay are supposed to be. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. <laughs> and then I saw Councilman Rosenberg. Here he is. Welcome. Hey, it's good to see y'all. I'm here to talk about, uh, first of all, number 11, um, which is a text amendment related to notice on reasonable accommodation requests. As it stands now, uh, when a reasonable accommodation request is approved or denied, there's really no notice requirement at all. So while there's a right to appeal, nobody knows that they can actually, that there's something to appeal. Right now, all they do is put it on a, a website that nobody has any reason to visit. So this text amendment would require notice to be mailed the same way it is for other BZA matters. Um, and I'd appreciate your consideration of that. Also, um, number 20, um, speaking as a resident, it's not in my district, um, but this is the freestanding emergency room for Bellevue, and I just want to tell you how excited I am about it and have heard so many positive things about it. This would be right at the main, on, a, on our main thoroughfare, right at the interstate on uh, Highway 70 South. It would be a great addition to the community, and I would urge your approval on that. And thank you very much for your time. And. Uh, See y'all soon. Thank you, Councilman. Appreciate that. And then I saw Councilman Parker. Welcome. Good afternoon, y'all. Um, thanks for being here today. I am here speaking in support of item 13. This is a um, East Nashville Community Plan Amendment. This is for the Lincoln Tech um, Auto Diesel College campus. Um, we did ask them to sort of put the community plan amendment first, and let's kind of go through that process before the zoning. So there's a, another zoning bill that will be coming behind this. Um, we did, they held four meetings in person on the campus, um, talking about both the SP and this community plan amendment. Um, lots of positive feedback. Um, we also had the required um, meeting specifically for the community plan amendment uh, that was held virtually. Again, lots of good discussion, lots of good feedback there. So I think they've got a lot of support for um, this thing moving forward and just wanted to speak in favor of that. No, item 13. Thank y'all. Thank you, Councilman. I think it's tentatively on consent. Thank you. All right. Director, Lisa, do you guys see any other council members? I don't. Oh. Oh, we didn't. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Councilman. Uh, he, he's going to wait. He's going to, okay. Councilman's going to wait. Okay. Anyone else? I want to make sure we always get all the elected officials. All right. I don't see any others. Okay. Good deal. Well, then that uh, concludes the recognition of the council members and appreciate everybody uh, coming down. And just so you know, council members can speak on the item as well during their time. Um, so that takes us to item E, which is items for deferral or withdrawal. And Lisa, are you going to guide us through this? Okay, go ahead. 
The following items are for deferral or withdrawal. Starting on page three of your agenda, item number one, 2016 SP 024005 McGavick House SP amendment. Staff recommendation is to defer to the November 10th Planning Commission meeting. Item number two, 2022 SP 040001 2635 Gallatin Avenue Dog Daycare. Staff recommendation is to defer to the November 10th Planning Commission meeting. Item number three on page four of your agenda, 2022 SP 065001, Barnes Road SP. Staff recommendation is to defer to the November 10th Planning Commission meeting. Item number four, 2022 SP 069001, 2400 Elliston Place SP. Staff recommendation is to defer to the November 10th Planning Commission meeting. Item number five, 2022Z098PR001, a rezoning request on Dickerson Pike. Staff recommendation is to defer to the November 10th Planning Commission meeting. Item number 6, 2022S-200-001, Plan of Hamilton Place. Staff recommendation is to defer to the November 10th Planning Commission meeting. Item number 7, 2022S-247-001, Millie Sweeney and Kirk M. Sweeney. Staff recommendation is to defer to the November 10th Planning Commission meeting. On page 5 of your agenda, item number 9, 2022Z014TX001, text amendment related to trees. Staff recommendation is to defer to the December 8th Planning Commission meeting. On number, I'm sorry, number 12A, 2022CP003002, Bordeaux Watts Creek Canes Trinity Community Plan Amendment, and the associated case 12B on page 6 of your agenda, 2022SP043001, 633 West Green Lane SP. Staff recommendation is to defer both items to the November 10th Planning Commission meeting. And I would note that Commissioner Blackshear is recusing herself from both items. Item number 16, 2018 SP 064001, Cubby Holes SP amendment. Staff recommendation is to defer to the November 10th Planning Commission meeting. On page 8 of your agenda, item number 24, 2022-COD-004001, a contextual overlay in District 7. Staff recommendation is to defer to the November 10th meeting. Item number 26, 2022-Z082PR-001, staff recommendation is to defer indefinitely, and that is an update from the agenda that you have in front of you. Um, so that would be to defer indefinitely. And on page 11 of your agenda, item number 36, 2022S-221-001, Hawks Haven. Staff recommendation is to defer to the February 9th, 2023 Planning Commission meeting. And item number 37, 2022S-231-001, Subdivision Plat Bright Solutions, Inc. property. Staff recommendation is to defer indefinitely. All right. Thank you, Lisa. And so, commissioners, you've heard the items for deferral withdrawal, and let's go through these slowly to make sure we have the correct items. So the items for deferral withdrawal are the following. Items 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 9, 12A, 12B, 16, 24, 26, 36, and 37. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, commissioners, we'll need a motion to defer those items. Is there a motion? Proper motion and second. Any other discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Ayes have it, and those items are deferred. Next is item F, which is the consent agenda, and Lisa will take us through these. And one note, um, Chair, for the items that were deferred, the November 10th meeting will once again be held in this location. The December 8th meeting, which we did have an item defer to, will be at our normal location at the Howard Office Building. Thank you. 
notice to the public, items on the consent agenda will be voted on at a single time. No individual public hearing will be held, nor will the commission debate these items unless a member of the audience or the commission requests that the item be removed from the consent agenda. I will now go through the items that are on tentative consent. I will call out the item number and the case name, and I will ask if there is anyone in opposition to the item. If there is anyone in opposition, please raise your hand, and then that item will be presented at the time that it appears on the agenda. Uh, on page five of your agenda, item number eight, 2022Z013TX001. Is there anyone in opposition to item eight? Okay, item eight will be presented. Item number 10, 2022Z015TX001, text amendment related to the DTC. Is there anyone in opposition to item number 10? 10 will be on consent. Item number 11, 2022Z016TX001, text amendment related to reasonable accommodations. Is there anyone in opposition to item number 11? 11 will be on consent. On page six of your agenda, item number 13, 2022CP005002, East Nashville Community Plan Amendment. Is there anyone in opposition to item number 13? 13 will be on consent. Item number 14, 2022CP010001, Midtown Green Hills Community Plan Amendment. Is there anyone in opposition to item number 14? 14 will be on consent. <coughs> item number 15, 2016SP0390005, Bento Nashville Amendment. Is there anyone in opposition to item 15? 15 will be on consent. On page seven of your agenda, item number 17, 2021 SP 071003, 12th Avenue South SP Amendment. Is there anyone in opposition to item number 17? 17 will be presented. Item number 18, 2022 SP 0490015th and Church. Is there anyone in opposition to item number 18? 18 will be on consent. Item number 19, 2022 SP 0600011, 1401 Church Street. Is there anyone in opposition to item 19? 19 will be on consent. Item number 20, 2022 SP 0640001, TriStar Centennial Medical Center, Bellevue. Is there anyone in opposition to item number 20? 20 will be presented. Item number 21, 2011 UD 001008, Primrose Neighborhood UDO. Is there anyone in opposition to item number 21? 21 will be presented. Item number 22, 2022 UD 001001, Beamham Automotive Midtown UDO. Is there anyone in opposition to item 22? 22 will be on consent. Item number 23, 2022 COD 003001, Contextual Overlay in District 15. Is there anyone in opposition to item 23? 23 will be presented. Item number 25, 2022HL006001, Historic Landmark Overlay on 2nd Avenue South. Is there anyone in opposition to item number 25? 25 will be on consent. On page 9 of your agenda, item number 27, 2022Z088PR001, Rezoning on North Avondale Circle. Is there anyone in opposition to item number 27? 27 will be on consent. Item 28 is a disapproval, so that one will be presented. Item number 29, 2022Z097PR001, a rezoning on West Sharp Avenue. Is there anyone in opposition to item 29? 29 will be on consent. Item 30, 2022Z102PR001, is there anyone in opposition to item number 30? 30 will be on consent. Item 31A, 2022Z105PR001, and 31B, I'm sorry, 89P030001, it's a rezoning and PUD cancellation on Clarksville Pike. Is there anyone in opposition to 31A and 31B? Those items will be on consent. Item number 32 on page 10 of your agenda, 2022Z113PR001, a rezoning on 40th Avenue North. Is there anyone in opposition to item number 32? 32 will be on consent. 
Item 33, 2022Z135PR001, a rezoning request on Milson Street and Joe Johnson Avenue. Is there anyone in opposition to item number 33? 33 will be on consent. 34, 2013 UD 0020040, Murfreesboro Pike UDO. Is there anyone in opposition to item number 34? 34 will be on consent. 35 will be presented. And 36 and 37. Okay. Chair, I'm going to run through the captions now. information for our audience. If you are not satisfied with the decision made by the Planning Commission today, you may appeal the decision by petitioning for a writ of cert with the Davidson County Chancery or Circuit Court. Your appeal must be filed within 60 days of the date of the entry of the Planning Commission's decision. To ensure that your appeal is filed in a timely manner and that all procedural requirements have been met, please be advised that you should contact independent legal counsel. The following items are on the consent agenda. Beginning on page five, item number 10, 2022Z015TX001. It's a request to amend Title 17 of the Metro Code to refine site plan review procedures within the DTC. Staff recommendation is to approve. Item number 11, 2022Z016TX001. It's a request to amend the zoning code uh, to require written notice to neighboring property owners on the decision of a reasonable accommodation. Staff recommendation is to approve with a substitute. Page six of your agenda, item number 13, 2022CP005002, East Nashville Community Plan Amendment. It's a request to amend the East Nashville Community Plan by changing from district major institutional to T4, um, T4 mixed use corridor, I'm sorry, district major institutional and mixed use corridor to community center neighborhood evolving and transition policy for properties along Gallatin Pike, Douglas Avenue, and Strauss Avenue. Staff recommendation is to approve. Item number 14, 2022 CP010001, Midtown Green Hills. It's a request to amend the major and collector street plan in the area of Midtown within the Green Hills Midtown Community Plan, including portions of various streets. Staff recommendation is to approve, including with the updated memo, uh, updated chart that was in a memo that was handed out to you prior to the meeting. Item number 15, 2016 SP 039005, Bento Nashville Amendment. It's a request to amend an SP on property located at, uh, on 3rd Avenue South to permit a mixed use development. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove with all, all conditions. And I would note that Commissioner Blackshear is recusing herself from that item. <laughs> Item number 18, 2022 SP049001, 15th and Church. It's a request to rezone from MUIA to SP for properties located on Church Street and 15th Avenue North to permit a mixed use development. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. Item number 19, 2022 SP060001, 1401 Church Street. It's a request to rezone from MUI to SP for properties located on Church Street and 15th Avenue North to permit a mixed use development. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. On page eight of your agenda, item number 22, 2022 UD001001, the Beeman Automotive Midtown UDO. It's a request to apply our urban design overlay to various properties on, located along Broadway, 16th Avenue North. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove with all conditions, including update, updated NDOT recommendations that were on a memo that was handed out to you prior to the meeting. Item number 25, 2022HL006001. It's a request to apply a historic landmark overlay district to properties located on 2nd Avenue South. A staff recommendation is to approve. On page 9 of your agenda, item number 27, 2022Z088PR001. It's a request to rezone from RS7.5 to R10 for properties located on North Avondale Circle. A staff recommendation is to approve. 
Item number 29, 2022Z097PR001. It's a request to rezone from RS5 to R6A for property located on West Sharp Avenue. Staff recommendation is to approve. Item number 30, 2022Z102PR001. It's a request to rezone from RS10 to R10 for property located on River Drive. Staff recommendation is to approve. Item number 31A, 2022Z105PR001. It's a request to rezone from CLCS and RS7.5 to MULANS and RM20ANS for property located on Clarksville Pike. Staff recommendation is to approve the associated case on page 10, item 31B, 89P, 030001, the shops at Bordeaux. It's a request to cancel a portion of a planned unit development for properties located on Clarksville Pike. Staff recommendation is to approve. Item number 32, 2022Z113PR001. It's a request to rezone from RS5 to RM20ANS for properties located on 40th Avenue North. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions. Item number 33, 2022Z, 135PR, 001. It's a request to rezone from CS to MULANS for properties located on Milson Street and Joe Johnston Avenue. Staff recommendation is to approve. Item number 34, 2013 UD, 002-040, Murfreesboro Pike UDO. It's a request for modification to a UDO for various properties located on Murfreesboro Pike. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions. And I believe that you also received a memo on that one. Yes, um, so it would be consistent with the memo that was handed out uh, prior to the meeting. And then under other business on page 11 of your agenda, item number 38, new employee contracts for Eric Matravers, Laszlo Martin, and Rashida Pardue. And item number 42, to accept the director's report. Thank you, Lisa. And on item 34, the memo has in the subject line, item 34, request to modification. Yes. Okay. Perfect. All right, commissioners. So long list. We'll go through these slow so we get them right. Um, these items will be on the consent agenda and voted on all at one time. And so the items to be voted on on the consent agenda are the following. Items 10, 11, 13, 14, 15, 18, 19, 22, 25, 27, 29, 30, 31A, 31B, 32, 33, 34, 38, and 42. Is that correct, Lisa? Yes. All right, commissioners, you've heard the items for adoption on the consent agenda. Is there a motion to approve? That's a proper motion. And second, any other discussion? So um, there is a couple of items that um, many of you and myself are, are big projects, and I just uh, felt like this is why we are, um, before we vote on the consent agenda, our director would like to say a few words, and it's coming from the heart from, from both of us. Um, you'll note on here an update to the major and collector street plan, um, which was work that we prepared in total partnership with NDOT. I'm grateful for their staff, but also with many of the properties in Midtown that were developing um, seemingly at once, although um, you know we know that development occurs in phases. I want to acknowledge those property owners, many of them on the agenda, for working with us and for um, being flexible when we said, you know, to really improve the function of Midtown, we're going to need to improve the bikeways, the sidewalks, the landscape sections, and they were at the table with us. Um, and so we believe that um, our city should continue to grow, but grow with investments in the types of amenities that everyone needs. And we are grateful that the folks who are investing in this area share that vision and for their work. And so um, we have a letter from Councilman O'Connell who talks about this being the type of template for how the city should work with the private sector in fast-growing areas. And we're grateful for all of those contributions. So thank you. And I, I did just want to acknowledge the work of Lisa 
and John Houghton, who spent a long time and a lot of work um, to help us get this right. Right of way is not sexy, but it matters. And it matters a lot. And that what we were able to accomplish is, is, is a, a proposal for right of way to um, meet the needs of this, of this city in this area. And we hope to continue to do work like this, not just for the benefit of Midtown, but for all the folks who are accessing our goods and services through and around Midtown and elsewhere. So thank you, Lisa, uh, for your hard work. And thank you, Chairman. Yeah, no, I think I was extremely impressed um, with the team. So I, I think all the commission, and I think that they they listened to us and our comments during discussion, and I think that, that they jumped on this very, very quickly. And these sites are um, sites that we all drive by every day, and, and they're very, very um, important sites to the city. So thank you, Lisa, thank and you, your team. Okay. So we have a proper motion, and second, any other discussion on the consent agenda before we move forward? All right, seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Ayes have it, and the consent agenda is adopted. So, commissioners, that means that the following items are to be considered, and so we have seven items, and I think this is correct, Lisa, make sure that I got my numbers right, but we're going to consider items 8, 17, 20, 21, 23, 28, and 35. Is that correct? Okay, so before we'll let everybody kind of, if if your item is done, if you could um, leave the room quickly and we appreciate y'all coming down and then we'll move forward in a second. So um, just a reminder, and some, some folks that have come down have never been here before, so we are a friendly group. We're all volunteers up here except for the staff, um, and so, you know, we try to um, go through these, and, and I always ask everyone when we have a lot of people, always be professional, address the chair, um, and we appreciate that, and we'll be professional to you, and we, all, and we listen to everyone, and so we really appreciate that. And how it goes is we'll do the, the team, the staff will um, present the presentation of the project. We'll open up the public hearing. The applicant will present. Um, and then um, everybody will have a chance to speak in the public hearing. First, we'll do folks that want to speak for the project. And then we'll do folks after they finish. Then we'll do folks that want to speak in opposition. And you'll have two minutes each. Um, and then after that, um, um, the applicant has a two-minute rebuttal, uh, and then the council member, and then we'll close the public hearing, and then that's when we'll deliberate the, uh, the project. And so now we're on items to be considered, which is item number eight. Hello, Chair. Can everyone hear me? Okay. I'll be presenting this item. Uh, this is item number eight. It's a text amendment. Um, it's a request to amend the zoning code related to parking minimums. Uh, I wanted to walk through some background with you and then a proposed substitute that we all that we have as staff. Um, so I think as many as you all know, minimum parking is a legal requirement to build parking. It would be based on the use of a property, not necessarily the zoning. And then it's also based in at times um, on the location of the use within the greater Nashville area. And so you have different parking standards for UZO and outside of UZO, different uses require different levels of parking. Um, from a minimum standpoint. 
Um, in looking at some of the adopted frameworks that we've had, um, such as the Mayor's um, Sustainability Advisory Committee, one of the things that they looked at was reducing vehicle miles traveled um, as it relates to the Climate Action Plan. And Requiring parking encourages more vehicle miles traveled um, because sort of inducing the demand of parking or cars when you are requiring a minimum amount of parking. Required parking also increases small, sprawl, congestion, greenhouse gases. Um, cars and vehicle miles are the greatest um, source of emissions um, when you're looking overall at that. Um, it also can impact greatly um, housing, the, the provision of housing, um, especially for smaller, what we refer to as missing middle housing. And so those are the types of smaller projects, not the large sort of Texas wrap projects, but smaller housing projects um, in the, you know, four to 10 sort of range. And the requirement of parking can really have an impact on those types of small uses. Nashville Next spoke to the, the removal of, re of parking minimums, indicating that removing parking minimums can reduce housing, free up property for the uses, and also supports walkability and transit. And so this is something that we've been talking about sort of as a planning staff, even going back as far as Nashville Next. Um, we do recognize that there are concerns, legitimate concerns, uh, around um, the ease of access and spillover from um, parking not being provided necessarily on a site. Um, however, within the UZO, parking is currently already not required along multimodal corridors per a text amendment that was passed in 2020. Much of the commercial would already be exempted through those multimodal corridors. Additionally, smaller um, neighborhood focused commercial are typically already exempted due to size. So within the UZO, you have exemptions right now for um, if a restaurant is under a certain square footage, it would be exempted totally from parking requirements. The same goes for retail. And so many of those neighborhood facing uses are already exempt from parking requirements. Uh, this is a map to indicate to you where the multimodal corridors are located within the UZO. The UZO is the hatched black area. The dark blue lines are the multimodal corridors, and so those would be locations currently where parking is exempted within the UZO. So that's today without the text amendment. So after publication, we um, made a few tweaks, and you have those in a memo. Um, the substitute would remove, continue to remove the minimum parking requirement. Um, it retains the UZO standard for other uses. So for instance, we have some UDOs, urban design overlays, that are outside of the UZO, but that refer to the UZO parking standards. So let me just sort of walk through that for a second, because I know that there are all kinds of letters that I just threw around. So for instance, the downtown Donaldson urban design overlay, Within that overlay, it says you are allowed to use the UZO standards for parking. And so we didn't want to get into a situation where you've had a UDO that's been adopted that has had previous community conversation that then we're changing the standards within that. And so we've added some language into the substitute that would essentially say if you have a UDO or an SP that has already been approved that has indicated UZO standards, then the standards that are in the code remain as the minimum required. And so by doing that, we are not sort of changing that community conversation that's happened specific to those sort of special zoning districts that are utilizing the UZO parking standard. We have also, currently the code indicates that if you are providing required parking in, in a parking structure, for instance, that that FAR is exempted or the, that area is exempted from your FAR. So in other words, you're not sort of punished by having that parking in your FAR calculations, floor area ratio calculations. And so what we've done with the substitute that we're proposing is to indicate that if you're within the UZO, and you're not required to have any parking at all, you can still exempt parking from your FAR calculations if you choose to provide it. We didn't want to get into a situation where we were punishing someone that, would, that was choosing to have parking, which this is not a bill that would prohibit parking, it's just a bill that wouldn't require it. And so we've added a condition, or added a, a language into the substitute that would make that clear. Um, 
couple of additional tweaks that we've made is the parking minimums within the UZO would become parking maximums for uses within the UZO. So if you do choose to have parking, you can have it up to that threshold, so it becomes a maximum. We've exempted one and two family from the maximum. We didn't want to have a situation where if someone had an extra long driveway, tandem, uh, tandem parking counts within one and two family. So we didn't want them to that to be a, a situation where you would all of a sudden not be able to have the driveway that you have. So we took out one and two family. We've also included DTC within those maximums. So the DTC, which includes the gulch and many other areas surrounding, has not required parking for many years. So they have not had minimum parking requirements, but they will be looped into this maximum. So we're setting the ceiling for them as well. And then we also made an exemption in the parking table that would allow small uses such as those, as those neighborhood level uses that maybe if you're a thousand square feet where you wouldn't, where your, all of your square footage would be exempted, we're allowing them to still have some parking up to the maximum. I wanted to walk you through a couple of uh, charts that we that we looked at when we were doing our analysis. Um, the UZO is heavily served by WeGo, our public transit system. You can see that the green lines are showing you the the WeGo routes within the UZO. This chart, you can see the sort of little green shaded areas. That is showing the quarter mile radius from transit stop, and so. The vast majority of the UZO is within a quarter mile radius, which is sort of considered what is comfortable for someone to walk easily to a transit stop. So most of the UZO is within a quarter mile radius. Additionally, car ownership within the UZO is the lowest within the county, indicating that people are already making some alternative choices when it comes to transportation. Um, in continuing to look at our analysis, um, tying parking up in land is, is the, has the potential to remove needed housing units, especially in sort of those missing middle. Looking at where we are now with availability of ride share, transit, walking, mixed uses being included in areas, those are all on the rise. This allows owners to make their own choices about parking as the developments are coming in up to a certain threshold. It doesn't prohibit parking. It just sets a maximum and allows um, those decisions to be made. Um, if there are concerns around existing commercial areas, many of which are already exempt, then there is the uh, possibility of working with NDOT to extend um, the residential parking permit if neighborhoods choose to go that route. So given all of this, staff recommendation is to approve the proposed changes with the substitute as outlined in the memo that you received today. I'm sorry, you received it earlier this week and has been posted on the website. Thank you, Lisa. <clears throat> and so um, we'll open this item for public hearing. And the ac the actual applicant is is the councilman. Councilman Sledge, you want to come on up now or uh, just start us off and then we'll... Yeah, sure. Thank, thank you, Chair. Commissioners, Welcome. I'll be brief because I do know folks are here to speak. Um, Ms. Milligan obviously did an excellent job in describing both the substitute and the what I'll call tweaks to the substitute within the memo, and I'm supportive of all of those. I wanted to just give the commission a, a brief um, summary of why I brought this to you. Um, I filed this back at the end of August. Um, after several years, I've been before you as a commission regarding housing, um, especially regarding missing middle housing. This commission approved a couple years ago um, something that's pretty significant in our city, which was an upzoning of two uh, urban core neighborhoods in Wedgwood Houston and Chestnut Hill and a big motivation for myself and for residents and for this commission was missing middle housing. Um, we are starting to see the effects of that. We're starting to see the positive effects of that. I'm happy to say that there are several um, projects that are either um, going through the UDO process with planning or have already been approved through their final plans um, where we are starting to establish those three to four units on that lot or we're having lots combined and doing, I think the most we've seen is eight um, that are being put together that's that kind of cottage style housing that we are quite frankly missing right now. Um, so in my continued conversations with folks, this 
topic of parking continued to come up. And I know that y'all have considered recently even items that might be on a corridor, but the frontage doesn't quite work to qualify within our current and our current legislation. And so that's when I thought we need an overhaul. We need an overall look at this to see what we're doing. What you're considering today kind of falls in the middle, maybe slightly toward a little, um, a little more leading edge, but not totally leading edge when it comes to national parking uh, minimum and maximum legislation. We have more than 200 cities across the country who have some kind of legislation, like the one that we have currently. Some of them go all the way. They take parking minimums out of their entire municipality, and some of them do that and institute maximums. Because we're a consolidated government and we're very different in that approach and that we have rural areas, suburban areas, and urban areas, I thought it best for us to talk through the UZO. This is, as Ms. Milligan explained, an extension or expansion of our current plan. Um, I will give you just one brief example that I, I have dealt with now where I thought this just doesn't make sense, and I, and I hope you would um, give me a little bit of opportunity to explain. District 17, we have all different types of zoning. We even have core frame, which is pretty wild, but we have core frame zoning along the interstate. And I had an applicant come to me, and we are doing a fairly significant, dense project in District 17. It's going to be 20 stories, but it's right next to the interstate. It's right next to downtown. And when I talked to that applicant about reducing parking, um, that applicant was amenable. Unfortunately, that applicant did not apply for, or they did not apply for what we have currently because even though their frontage was on a major transit corridor, it was on the 52, um, because they have frontage on multiple sides, our current legislation, our current law does not allow for that. So we have where we're encouraging density on a tightly packed core frame zone area where we want to put 300 units, and they were approved by the BZA. They had to have a sky plane um, amendment. But that the applicant wanted to do less parking and actually didn't qualify because of because we have I think rightfully taken small steps to see what will work. I think we're at the point now where we know we can we can go further. We can do this to where we have the minimums removed in some, in most instances. Placing those maximums on I think is a is a very commendable move by the commission and I support it. Um, and so I would hope that as you listen to comments today that you would maybe keep that in mind, that we're trying to expand upon what we've done now, something that I think probably has gone fairly unnoticed in everybody's day-to-day -day life, um, but that can have major impacts. One final thing I will note, um, it was mentioned the, the map about WeGo and access to transit. Um, several of you may be aware. Thankfully, we have just now gotten over our pre- COVID introduction, I would say, pre-pandemic levels where we're at about 107% of service levels. Our ridership levels are north of 90% of that pre-COVID ridership. So we are seeing that transition in our city. I'm seeing it in the district I represent. I think we're seeing it throughout the urban core where people are wanting to use the services and we as a council and the administration are attempting to provide the funding and services that meet that demand. I think this goes part and parcel with that move and I'd ask that you consider Consider that holistically as you consider this today. Thank you for your service. Thank you, Councilman. Appreciate you coming down very much. And we'll let you um, finish finish the hearing uh, after everybody else speaks. So now we are on to anyone wishing to speak in favor. Come on up. Just line up. But if you'll sit over by the, um, if you'll go to the microphone, um, it just picks up better. And then that way. And if you'll state your name and address. And so when, when everyone speaks, make sure you state your name and address for the record. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairman, and good evening, Commissioners. My name is Scott Morton with Smith G Studio. Um, address is uh, 1005 North 14th Street in East Nashville. Um, I'm here tonight to support the, uh, the parking bill. Um, I think it needs a little bit of work, but I think we can get through it. And it has more benefits than it does um, impacts to our city. I wholeheartedly support the original intent of this bill. Uh, this line of thinking is consistent with progressive policies of our peer, uh, other peer cities and will provide much more flexibility for the market to provide adequate parking in our urban environments. Um, that said, I'm, I'm concerned about a few of the unintended and intended consequences associated with the current draft regulations in two specific areas. Um, my understanding is that the UZO parking minimums that are current today will now become the maximums. And I 
in principle, support the idea of parking maximums, but I want to make sure that we have the right metric. Uh, and I have provided some, some charts that I'll speak to in a moment. Um, the philosophy around this bill trusts that the private sector is going to provide adequate parking uh, to ensure that they have a successful development. And I would furthermore suggest that if we, if, you know, we do trust the market to do that, then we should likewise trust them to not provide excessive parking uh, for their developments. Um, the bottom line, working in this industry for over 20 years, parking is one of the most expensive costs when it comes to development. Um, parking in parking structures can up cost upwards to $40,000 a space. And so developers are ex extremely keen to not overpark developments to ensure that they don't have added costs because in this market, it's extremely difficult to make projects work and you don't want to waste money on parking you don't need. Um, the second part about it is, is equity. I think while the elimination of minimum parking requirements is probably more beneficial to some land uses than others. For example, uh, in the hospitality market, hotels historically are at all-time parking demand levels. We see some hotels with zero parking and some with less than 5% need for parking. Um, so this will be an excellent benefit for those types of projects that include those uses that depend so heavily on rideshare um, transitions. Other land uses such as multifamily aren't quite there yet. Uh, multifamily apartments um, to be able to be uh, funded, financed, and ultimately succeed in getting tenants, they have to have parking. And I would say that um, in this particular example, uh, I'm running out of time because I'm used to having more than two minutes, so let me get to my point. Um, the examples I pulled was doing some research on market and affordable multifamily projects so we can actually see some objective data associated with that. And for the majority of all the projects that we've worked on in Nashville over the last 10 years, every single project has provided more parking than is allowed in these current standards for maximums. And that's just to meet the tenant demand. And Thank so you. I would argue that we could work on some changes to the maximums It would be even better. Thank you. Thank you. Come on up. Uh, Sean Braystead, 1204 Pinnock Avenue in Cleveland Park neighborhood. Um, as a home mortgager in a fast-growing neighborhood in the UZO and as someone who relies on street parking in front of my house, there's a real possibility that at some point this new ordinance, if passed, could inconvenience me in some way as it relates to parking. I may have to walk a bit further or install parking in my backyard if things take off or look to alternative forms of transportation, but that's okay. That's what I signed up for. I chose to live in an urban neighborhood near the downtown core, not because of what it was exactly when I moved in six and a half years ago, but because I saw the potential for a mixed-use commercial and residential neighborhood, not unlike how the neighborhood was several decades ago before policies and practices resulted in disinvestment and neglect. We've seen some progress, and I hope to see more. I want more retail, restaurant, and multifamily residential uses within walking distance, and if that helps us get there, that's great in my opinion. If reducing parking requirements to help reduce costs and spur creativity and entrepreneurship uh, creates a little bit of incon inconvenience, that's okay. It could also positively impact the affordable housing challenges we face. Will it solve them? No, of course not. It won't take a big bite out of the problem, but in reality, there aren't any big bite solutions out there, especially in this state with our limitations. We can only hope to have a, little, a lot of small bites that accumulate into a bigger bite to improve the situation or at least slow the progression of the problems. I hope this commission passes this legislation onto the council because it represents a positive, progressive step forward in the zoning laws of our city. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Next. <coughs> Good evening, commissioners. My name is Chad Grout. I live in Williamson County, 542 Turtle Creek Drive in Brentwood, uh, former neighbor of, of Brett Withers, though I will say. So I, I own commercial property in Councilman Sledge's district. Uh, and so I have been paying close attention to this topic with great interest uh, for a long time. Uh, the downtown code was passed, I think, originally in 2009. It removed parking minimums for all of the downtown core. And I don't think anybody's going to say that we have not built much parking downtown. I see large garages getting built, and as Scott specified, these developers are over-parking their developments because of tenant demand. Tenant demand for what? They've got to drive everywhere. 
every, we allow too much parking, too much capacity, and we are going to choke on our own concrete. Uh, it's time for us to change direction. It's time for us to inspire neighborhood development. Nobody goes out to eat. Nobody spends their weekends going to places that they know are going to have oceans of parking. They go where they're going to be able to walk around. They go where they're going to be able to bike. And we want to build the city that we all want to live in. Um, my particular development, that I, uh, my commercial property that I own in Wedgwood, Houston, uh, this particular matter is relevant to me in the sense, in the sense that uh, I am making some leasing decisions based on gaming the UZO exemptions in the parking code, um, and I would really like to just make my leasing decisions in accordance with tenant demand. And I am eaten up with tenants that don't care about having any parking. Sure, there are lots of businesses that wish they had oceans of parking, and I tell all of them just to drive 15 miles south, and they'll have all the parking that they need. Good luck. Thanks. Thank you. Welcome. That fact to follow. <clears throat> uh, my name is Neil Kornitik. Uh, my family and I live at 1704 Martin Street, uh, 37203, uh, Wedgwood, Houston, uh, that Chad was just talking about. Um, we support more housing and less parking. Um, when we moved to Nashville, we sold one of our vehicles. Um, without doing that, we, white, we likely would not have been able to afford the house that we do and live where we do. Um, unburdening ourselves of a car was an action that we were pri privileged enough to take. There's almost 125,000 households with only one car in Nashville and another 20,000 without a car. Some make this choice voluntarily and some are forced to make this choice financially. We should not burden them further with paying for more parking than they will not need or use. I want more people to get to experience our neighborhood like we do. Some of the best parts of this city were built prior to these mandates. We can undo them. This is not a silver bullet for all our problems, but an incremental step. I see the concerns in my neighborhood, but I know that we can manage them. During soccer games in Woodwood, Houston, I've taken pictures of streets full of cars, but parking lots that are there available for people to park with three hours of free parking are often completely empty. I urge you to move on this tonight. Each parking structure that we build today will still be here when my daughter is older than I am. Thank you, and I hope you'll support it. Thank you. Welcome. Hello. Cool. Hi, um, Nicole Williams, 2028 Edison Park Lane um, in District 20. So I also live in the urban core, I guess, ish. Um, so I have a car. I don't ride a bike. I don't take the bus. Um, I don't usually do ride share. So this bill is completely against my like personal self-interest. Um, and if I were going to be selfish, I would say, yeah, like it's really nice to go places and not have to worry about finding a place to park. Uh, but it would be nicer to me to have a city that has walkable neighborhoods, um, enough affordable housing to um, allow people who work here to live here. Um, communities that feel like communities versus seas of parking lots and parking garages. And I would just really encourage you all, I know that there's going to be some angst on this board um, based on conversations that I have heard from you all in the past. I think that there will be some pushback, but I want you all to please be brave. Like this is a big step, but as Council Member Sledge explained, it's actually not as big of a step as it might feel like or it might look like. You all trust your city planners. We have some of the best city planners in the country. Um, I'm not at all biased, uh, but like we really truly do. Um, and you trust them because they do this work every day. They're brilliant. They don't do anything or make any recommendation lightly without really truly seriously considering the potential ramifications. And so please just trust that they know what they're talking about and um, and just be brave for us. Thank you. 
Thank you. Come on up. Uh, good evening, Commission. My name is Craig Clark. I'm a resident of the Maxwell Heights neighborhood, 715 Myrtle Street. Uh, I'm also a practicing architect here in the city and having worked in developments and in architecture for over 10 years, five of which here in Nashville. I stand in full support of removing parking minimums that the original legislation stated to allow the developments to say how much parking is needed to make a development successful. Requiring a certain minimum number of parking spots is one of the largest difficulties when preparing feasibilities and designs for these developments. And as stated previously, the cost of parking drives up the cost of developments ultimately passed along to building occupants, whether it's residents, whether it's office tenants. I am not in favor of the substitute that implements parking maximums and the confusing language with regards to the FAR and impacts of parking. If Nashville had a realistic transit solution that provides reliable, adequate alternatives to car dependency, the substitute would make more sense. Having moved to Nashville as a single car household, we ultimately felt we needed to grow to two cars to survive here in the city. We want a walkable, equitable city, but we cannot put the cart before the horse. We need to look at this in conjunction. So I support removing parking minimums, but I do not support the sub substitute. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Good evening, Commissioners. Uh, thank you for your service. Peyton Bradford, 1262 Battlefield Drive. Um, I'm here uh, in support uh, of removal of parking minimums from the UZO. I am not a resident of the UZO, but I am a user of the UZO. Uh, I have worked uh, in and around uh, the downtown core uh, for the entirety of my career um, and routinely uh, visit neighborhoods within the UZO with my young son. Uh, never once in my time have I ever had an issue finding parking, uh, convenient parking. Um, the highest and best use of the property in the UZO is for uh, uses other than parking. Um, thank you. Thank you. Well. Hi, everyone. Uh, Lonnie and John Hutchins. I'm the owner of 444 Humphreys in uh, Wedgwood, Houston. Uh, I'm from Gallatin originally. I've been going to the Wedgwood, Houston Fairgrounds neighborhood my entire life. Uh, I've been the owner of 444 Humphreys since 2011. I've seen it change. I lived there uh, for a year in 2013 when I started renovating the place. I am for um, doing away with the parking minimums. Uh, there's already been a lot said to how that uh, helps uh, people developing their properties on a business side of things, um, but I can speak on the smaller end of the spectrum. It's a small lot. It's multi-use. It's never going to be an SP situation. Um, I've been developed 360 degrees around my property, and um, I, I felt bad about knocking down trees at one point, but everyone else did that around me already. I'm um, kind of in if you can't beat them, join them situation. Getting rid of the minimums uh, would allow my property and business, which is a very successful art gallery, the Julia Martin Gallery, uh, the We Own This Town podcast is um, is recorded in the, the back office, and there's a recording studio in the bottom, uh, to be able to compete with my neighbors, to grow, uh, to, to keep some um, uh, some of what why people were in that neighborhood for so long to begin with, it's going to allow me to afford the property. Um, and and keep the spirit of that neighborhood as an arts district, we'll be able to use some of the units that we have in, in development right now for work, work live and not just sort of community office space. And you know, these are the same size apartments as much, much larger developments just half a block away that are already working with, you know, getting their parking down in the context of much larger developments. So um, I want to commend uh, Councilman Sledge for staying on this and it's something that we've all been talking about for a very long time. Uh, and I'll just leave you with, with one last thought that the Wedgwood Houston neighborhood is a really great uh, sort of, um, um, uh, petri dish, you could say, because it's sort of the last to be bought out like it has. So, um, and they're surrounded by lots of Vanderbilt thank you. and city property. So, thank Appreciate you. Appreciate it. Welcome. Mm -hmm. uh, hello, my name is DJ Sullivan. I uh, do the social media site East Nashville Urban Design. I live at 2220 Scott Avenue in District 7. Um, Minimum parking requirements were a historic mistake. Many of our peer cities in the US have already removed 
their 1950s era parking minimums, some just this week. They were always a bad idea. 2022 just happens to be the year Nashville gathered the political courage to finally make the right decision. The harms minimum parking requirements have done are well documented. They're a subsidy to oil and car companies. They've contributed to sprawl and all its associated ills. As housing costs skyrocket and cause displacement, parking minimum laws block desperately needed new housing from being built. Some fear the immediate effects of removing parking minimums. Parking management was an issue before this bill and it will continue to be an issue forever, even after parking minimums have been completely abolished. Managing parking is an ongoing task for cities around the world, but it's not a reason to delay correcting a historic mistake. Getting rid of parking minimums is a foundational move that supports future investments in walkability, transit, and our general physical and financial health as a city. Thank you. I'm done. All Thank right. you, sir. Appreciate it. Hello, Commission. Doug Sloan, 6354 Torrington Road, Nashville. Uh, I'm in favor of uh, this piece of legislation. I, I agree with the removal of uh, Park, parking maximums, uh, well, parking minimums. And let me say this, that I think that what we need to do is look at the study of what those maximums should be. Uh, I don't disagree with the legislation at all. Uh, it is when it, you create those maximums, what studies have we done to determine that those numbers are correct, that that's where the maximums should be? Uh, that's my only issue uh, with the bill at all. Otherwise, I, th I think this is definitely moving in the right direction. And I, and I think, uh, like so many of the other speakers have said, that this is moving in the right direction to encourage mass transit and encourage more ridership. And I, and I think we need that to support. We do have a mass transit system here in Nashville, and this bill should help that. Thank you. Thank you. Council lady, I missed you or something. I don't, how did I do that? We, thank you for coming. Sorry. No worries. Welcome. I, I, as much I, time as you need. No worries. Um, thank you, Commissioners Councilwoman Angie Henderson. I represent District 34 in southwest Nashville um, that includes areas of Bellevue and Green Hills and um, uh, areas that are, uh, for the most part, outside of the UCO. Uh, that said, I have long had an interest in parking policy, uh, land use policy. As you all know, I've been before you over seven years uh, with four, I believe, text amendments um, with Title 17. And so um, I, I feel real strongly in the work of uh, this council body over these last two years um, and uh, appreciate that there are many among us uh, that understand how important land use policy is uh, to achieving the city that we want to live in and in some ways kind of undo uh, the, the ills of um, uh, previous decades when we were very focused on car oriented development. So I was also a co-sponsor uh, with Councilman Sledge and Councilman O'Connell of uh, removing the minimums on our uh, high capacity transit corridors and um, I am one of 10 co-sponsors uh, on this bill as well and I will imagine in time as, as colleagues uh, review this meeting um, and the decision that you all make and um, the community conversation uh, will join uh, uh, with Councilman Sledge in co-sponsorship. Um, I think what I would say also and know well um, as we move over to the council side of things. Uh, happily, our Title 17 bills are amendable uh, up through third reading. Uh, additionally, uh, for um, some more complicated bills like this, often you know we will have a, a second substitute. I think uh, in the end, when we passed the sidewalk legislation, I think, colleagues, that was the third substitute by the time we got there and we had the stakeholder meetings. Um, and we continue to work with staff and get uh, refinement on that. Um, so I, I would encourage you uh, to approve this uh, this evening um, because I know well with uh, great staff and real intention on the council side um, as to calibrating the maximums and so forth, um, we can continue uh, to do that work uh, with 
uh, commission staff on the council side. Um, I feel this is really important uh, policy at this time for this city. I think we were prescient in some regard downtown um, to remove those minimums, but what you have seen downtown is a whole lot of um, parking decks um, with towers on top of them. So, um, you know, it uh, you're just giving people the option not to have to uh, house cars, um, but house people. Um, it, it is a significant cost to build structured parking. And if we want to move towards a more walkable community, we're going to have to kind of back away um, from requiring places um, for parking cars. Cars. Uh, so with that, I encourage your support and thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Council Lady. Really appreciate you coming down. Welcome. That is an incredibly tough act to follow. Our hopefully future Vice Mayor, Councilmember Henderson. Um, I, uh, I don't want to repeat all the incredible points already made, so um, instead I want to speak about the smart parking contract currently before council and how I think that will alleviate a lot of the concerns of some residents in um, residential permitted parking areas. So as you may or may not know, INDOT and Traffic and Parking Commission and Councilmember Henderson herself have been critical in pushing forward this new smart parking contract that's going to really, um, first off, correctly value our public right-of-way that right now is vastly undervalued to tourists and anyone driving a car in downtown. Um, but more importantly, it's going to modernize paying for parking. You'll be able to use a credit card instead of coins and, most importantly for some of the opposition, improve our parking enforcement. Um, as part of that smart parking contract, we're going to hire eight additional um, enforcement officers that will focus on paid enforcement, which will free up the metro staff to be able to enforce things like cars parking in bike lanes, people parking illegally in permitted residential parking areas. Um, so I think that new smart parking contract that I believe already passed second reading um, is going to be critical in, in really improving enforcement in our already permitted residential areas and, and alleviate a lot of the concerns of people who are worried about people illegally parking in my residential parking area. Um, finally, my, my only um, regret with this bill is that it doesn't extend outside of the UCO. I live in Antioch right off of um, Route 55, and we had a meeting last night with John Houghton and Kathleen, I can't remember how to say her last name, about the Global Mall, and one of the things that kept coming up was how much we all hate these humongous seas of asphalt, all these huge parking lots in Antioch. We don't want them out there either, um, and this is a great first step to start to eliminate those huge seas of parking downtown, and hopefully it will work its way out to our part of town as well. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, James Guthrie, 312 South 11th Street. Uh, it's in the East End neighborhood of East Nashville, uh, also known as Five Points. I uh, just really want to commend and thank uh, Council Member Sledge for introducing this bill, the courage of the nine council members who have signed on as co-sponsors, uh, and the staff report, which not only supported it, but recommended an amendment that takes it even further. I think that's great. Uh, as the resident of a historic East Nashville neighborhood, I am especially concerned about the potential of losing our neighborhood character permanently. Uh, for over 100 years, we have been a vibrant, walkable, mixed-use neighborhood, and without reform or legislation of this kind uh, to allow businesses to set up shop with flexible footprints and to allow more missing middle housing to get us more neighbors to support those businesses, uh, we could lose that character and just become another characterless, car-dependent, decaying urban space. So ask you all to approve this bill and let it serve as a great foundational step in the process of building a Nashville for people. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anyone else wishing to speak in support? I'll make sure we get everybody. All right, seeing none, anyone wishing to speak in opposition? Come on up. Welcome. Hello, uh, my name is Bob Campbell Smith. Um, thank you for allowing this. This uh, I live at uh, 803 Fatherland Street in Edgefield in East Nashville, and uh, in a very walkable um, uh, neighborhood. I've lived there for 35 years, kind of for that reason. It's gotten better and better. And and I, <laughs> I this is very strange because I'm I came. 
Well, I'm not exactly in opposition of this, but I kind of in, in, in opposition. I actually agree with every one thing that's been said up here. I'm, I want more green. I want less cars. I want all of this. We have a specific. Uh, we I, um, this, we've just become aware of this bill in the last couple of days, and so there's unknowns for us, and uh, we uh, have a specific example in our neighborhood, the Tulip Street Church, the historic Tulip Street Church has a developer that wants to turn it into an event center. And we've met with them, and we're not necessarily against that. Our concern is traffic and parking. We have no place to put 600 people three times a week in our neighborhood. I'm not sure how this bill addresses that. That's my opposition. And I request, I'm asking for a deferral so Councilman Withers can call a meeting and, and talk to us about any concerns that we may have. Thank you. Thank you. We'll, we'll address that once we win the discussion. Thank you for coming, sir. Anyone else? Come on up. Good evening, everyone. I'm Sam McCullough with the Cleveland Park Neighborhood Association, and I've been in my neighborhood for 64 years. Needless to say, I won't be getting out doing much walking anymore due to this thing and a bad back surgery. But I agree with a lot of the things that has been said, but I think we need to make sure that we have parking in restaurants and things and, and venues that are uh, inviting everyone in. I have to have handicapped parking. I've got, I, I, I'd love to participate in a lot of the things in our neighborhood. Our neighborhood has come full circle from what it was when we were founded in 20. Oh, three. Um, <clears throat> I have to have the ability to get cars in and out. Most of my people who take me to, to something will take me to the door. Uh, I wish I could go without having to have a car, but I don't have that option anymore. Um, the things that we... Uh, we have some nice things in our district. Over in District 6, District 5, 7, um, we've come a long way in East Nashville. And I do support those places. And as long as I can get in and out in a car, I'll, be, I'll continue to support them. But um, we don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater when we're trying to make these changes and amendments to going forward and, and making sure that Nashville is a place where people can get around, even those of us who are handicapped. Hopefully I won't get any worse than having to use this or a rollator, but um, I'm one of those who can't get out like I used to. But I think that it is time for change, and I don't, like I said, like the gentleman said before me, um, we just are finding out about this. I just caught wind of this, I think, day before yesterday. So um, in working with our council person, I'm sure that we'll be able to come up with something, and, the, and you all reviewing all the information that you have seen today, uh, I'm sure that you all will be able to work it out. Thank you. Look forward to what you come up with. Thank you, sir. Welcome. Good afternoon. My name is Alice Forrester, and I'm a resident of 803 Fatherland Street, Historic Edgefield 37206, and I'm currently the neighborhood president. Um, I'm asking today for deferral. I just found out about this, and I know some of the communities were given the opportunity to discuss this bill. Uh, we were not. We didn't know about it. Um, I'm not opposed in general. I learned a lot today because I really didn't quite understand what this was about. And I'm a walker. I'm a cyclist. Uh, Historic Edgefield has come a long way. I've been there 35 years. We welcome development. But um, someone used the term spillover. We are a spillover parking lot for the Titan Stadium, all the venues on Woodland, and those license plates are not from the UZO. So I think the neighbors around me are walkers, bikers, commuting downtown, and we even struggled to do that. I commuted to Oktoberfest on my electric bike, and I couldn't get there, barely. My husband and I really took, were taking our life in our hands. So I would just love to have a little more time to know about it. As my husband mentioned, we have some communication and projects going where we're trying to work with developers to accommodate parking in the neighborhood. We're not against it, but this really opens a big can of worms for us. 
We're the closest neighborhood to the stadium. We're not Germantown. We're not Wedgwood, Houston. We're not downtown. We've been kind of a true residential neighborhood, a tiny pocket, and we've struggled, you know, to renovate. We're, we're a desirable area. We love visitors. We used to have home tours to bring people in. But we just don't know the implications of this and would love to find out just how can we preserve um, you know, some of the quality of our neighborhood while welcoming development. Um, and I really, really would love to have some time to do this, to talk to Councilman Withers and to get a group together. We'll get a community meeting. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Anyone else? Come on up. Um, council members, th thank you for the opportunity to talk to you. My name is Pete Greaves. I live at 913 Fatherland Street in East Nashville. Um, Alice had mentioned that she is the president of uh, HEN, the historic East Nashville neighborhood. I'm actually talking on behalf of HEN. Um, I guess more than anything else, I just want to echo. Let's, let's first of all say what we are asking is not about. This is not about nimbyism. This is not about not wanting affordable housing. This is not about, about not wanting de development in, in downtown Nashville. We already know what, what, what is not affected by this. Downtown Nashville is not, is not affected. The, the, the requirements were, were done away with some time. The transit corridors are not affected. The requirements were done away, uh, uh, away with some time. Um, there have already been exceptions made for small restaurants and small businesses that allow them to go ahead without parking. We've heard a lot of discussion about, um, about, uh, about the need to eliminate parking, and we actually agree with that. However, a term that you will very often find used when people talk about this is they will talk about autocentric development, development that focuses on the needs of cars. The reality is that residential development does not need to be autocentric, and we, and we completely support that. Um, the reality, however, is that many businesses are autocentric. If you'll pardon the, the rather facetious example, we are about to build a new, uh, a new uh, a Titan Stadium. The Titan Stadium is autocentric. Most people who go to Titan's games do not live in Nashville. They drive in. They will always drive in. There will always be cars. The Titan Stadium will have to provide parking. Now, that is obviously an extreme example, right? But when you have an event center that has a wedding of... 250 people, most people are not walking to a wedding. They're driving to a wedding. When you have a large restaurant that seats 500 people, if they're successful, people are coming from out of town. They're coming from Franklin, they're coming from Murfreesboro, etc. Lisa, he requested five minutes before the meeting. Give him three more. He's the actual spokesman for the neighborhood. Thank you. And so what we would like to do is we would like that this bill recognizes that there's a difference between residential development and commercial development. And there should be, in many cases, a difference between residential development and commercial de 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 development. There's been a lot of talk about peer cities. And the problem with talking about peer cities is it's very easy to go find the peer city that did what you want and say, hey, this city did this, they're just like Nashville. If you look at the list of peer cities that the city council used a couple of years ago, to look at cost of living, it's a list of nine cities. Of those nine cities, six of them have passed some level reducing parking requirements. None of them has been citywide. All of them have been focused on residential. If you look at what Raleigh did, they limited, they eliminated the need for downtown parking. They eliminated the the, the transit co co corridors. We all, uh, all, all, all already have those, and then they eliminated the parking requirement for residential development. If you look at what Denver did, Denver passed something that said you only need one parking place for every 10 units for residential development. And so the focus has not been on commercial. Um, as has been mentioned, we found out about this relatively recently. Unfortunately, we have not had a community me meeting in the last two months. Um, that Councilman Withers was able to come and present this to us and, and discuss this with us. And so as a neighborhood, we are digesting this for the first time. What we would like to ask is that this bill be deferred until maybe one meeting, two meetings, to give us the opportunity to have those meetings and to then work with the councilman and then to work with planning to, to address the issues of the unintended consequences that may occur with residential. Um, re residential is fine. 
We are concerned about the unintended consequences of eliminating the parking requirements from commercial developments in areas of ours which are largely residential. And so on that basis, we would like to ask that this bill be, be deferred for at least one, uh, one meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak in opposition? It's my first time at one of these meetings. I'm Emily Richer. I live on Russell Street at the corner of 9th Street in East Nashville, in Edgefield. I kind of consider it the North Street gate to my historic neighborhood. We're just a little, and the, my predecessors were from the same neighborhood. We're just a little three block by five block long, foot long sandwich with Woodland running on one side and Shelby on the other. We're so sensitive to commercial development. I'm here just as a human representative today of what spillover really looks like. I wish I could put a picture on my phone of what the 13 cars from the commercial office building a block away from me looks like every day. They line up starting at eight and they're there till five. It's brutal for me because it not only block, I mean, we're a historic district. We don't have curb cuts, we don't have driveways. This is a residential environment, a historic preservation district that just, we, we have no place else to go but the two spaces in front of our house and just one if you're on the corner like me. So that 13 car blockade every day, I count them every morning, five feet from my house, historic house right on the sidewalk, prevents a plumber from coming, it prevents a guest from coming, it prevents the street cleaner in the city from doing his job, he hasn't touched that curb in two years, it puts the burden on me to clean 170 linear feet of dirt and trash and dust to protect the storm drains, and I have to do it at night in the fall, and my neighbors come out worried for me, because it's a dangerous neighborhood, and the weekends. So the spillover's real. It's WeWork, we all know about WeWork, 500 office capacity, 28 parking spaces, 30 to the, I, I manage the premier WeWork lot. That's my job. I'm not compensated. WeWork collects the revenue from these tenants, and I'm the parking manager. So this is just this is just crazy. And I, I just like you to. I just want to say that. I have a garage. <laughs> I can park in my garage. My eight space, my 13 spaces are booked all day already. Thank What's going to happen now is the stress I feel is going to go to all my neighbors inland as you add more commercial businesses that are parking behind me. Thank you. So I speak for them. Thank you. Welcome. Good to see you. Good, good afternoon. Uh, Jason Holloman, 4210 Park Avenue. I'm here on behalf of particularly uh, Historic Edgefield uh, homeowners and and as to potential development at the Tulip Street Church. Um, I do understand that, that if that uh, particular space is converted to an event space, there will be uh, a landmark overlay and there will be discussions about that and that there is the ability to set some special specific conditions Conditions as to parking. We understand that. Um, I do think, though, we want to be sure that we're on the record that we don't want to be told at that time, well, we don't have parking requirements inside the UZO anymore, and this is inside the UZO. So um, I do want to be sure if we move forward with this type of proposal that we continue to utilize um, both uh, those types of overlays, um, but also throughout the UZO, we have other spaces spaces that are um, institutional and commercial spaces that are within na residential neighborhoods. And some of those will be required to seek a special exception permit, uh, and we may be able to address parking there. But some of these spaces uh, won't require those types of overlays. And I understand we've had a long policy of allowing multimodal uh, corridors to, to not have these parking minimums, um, and we're ratcheting that down. Uh, but I would encourage you that we have a major street and collector plan that identifies several subcategories of streets, corridors, collector streets,
streets and residential local streets. Um, there are commercial spaces on local streets in our neighborhoods. And uh, I've actually offered an amendment to one of the sponsors um, that we not uh, take away parking minimums on local streets with non-residential use. Um, I think that would capture a lot of the concerns. It would certainly capture the concerns of these neighbors, and I think it would capture the concerns of other neighbors, and I hope you'll consider it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anyone else wishing to speak in opposition? All right, seeing none, Councilman, you ready? I'll go here this time. Um, thank, thank you to everybody who came to spoke, um, who came to speak. Excuse me. Um, I do appreciate. I think I, I'm actually really encouraged by the tone of this conversation about where we are in the city and, and what we want to see. If I could offer just a, a brief bit of reassurance to some of the folk, some of the folks who spoke. Um, I live in a neighborhood where we just opened a 30,000 seat soccer stadium. So I, I, I get it. I, I do I do understand the concerns. We've had some very um, fun and creative ways that we've dealt with that. Um, a lot of people made a lot of money this year parking in their front yards. Um, but all that to say, I do understand the concerns. I do understand the thought process there. And I do appreciate all, all the viewpoints, viewpoints that have been presented. Um, I, I'll close with this. I, I know that the staff has been working on this for a couple of months now. Um, as you see, they even made tweaks based on feedback that they've received. Um, I do feel com I feel comfortable about where this bill is. I feel comfortable about the substitute and the memo that's been presented to you. Um, we still have several more weeks, almost a month, um, on our current council trajectory where we can talk through, and Councilmember Henderson noted, if more amendments or more tweaks are needed, we have the opportunity to do that. And we often avail ourselves of that in the council. I think for y'all's purposes, as you discuss it, I feel comfortable moving forward with this. I hope I hope you do too, and my commitment to you is that I'm going to continue to have um, open conversations as I have with several uh, folks over email about kind of my motivations and strategy regarding this, and I'll commit to continue those conversations. Thank you, Commissioners. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councilman. Appreciate that. All right, seeing no one else wishing to speak, I declare the public hearing closed. Commissioner Henley, you want to start us off? I knew when I was sit, seated next to the chair, it was for a special reason. Um, well, I'll start by saying this. One, I'm, I will echo um, the councilman. I am very encouraged by the conversation. I, I, I love the public discourse, and I think Nashville, as a, as a prominent and premier city, these are the kind of conversations that we need to be having. Um, there's a lot that I like about what I saw. There's a lot of things that, that do give me some concern. Um, and, you know, to summarize it, I think it, it seems a bit like we may be painting with too broad of a brush, um, especially in a city we all care deeply about and we're, we're trying to paint a masterpiece. I think, for, I think for us, you know, one of the things that we definitely need to do um, is, to, is to think about some of these ripple effects and these spillovers. Um, I, I live in the world of, of the built environment, and when you build things and you have policies, you still have to deal with human nature. Um, and that's one of the things I think a lot of the people that spoke against this, and even many that spoke in favor, they're talking about human nature and that time it takes for um, our civilization, our culture, our society to adjust to certain things. And people feel real pain when, when sometimes that doesn't happen quickly enough. Um, I would continue to advocate for for this to move forward. I think it needs to it needs to happen. Um, I'm of course I have a great affinity for the benefits that I think it brings to the housing opportunities for our city. I think it creates and unlocks a lot of potential um, in the in the housing sector, particularly in the smaller scale um, space where we're not losing roofs over people's heads to put cars that don't move or potentially spaces that aren't filled into neighborhoods. I think that's really important to understand in this, and I think some of the suggestions from many people that spoke are ones we should take in consideration, especially the ones about um about accessibility and universal design. I came back from Dallas. I'm not thinking that Dallas is exactly who we should model ourselves after, but they had a very um, methodical approach as to how they phased in some of their parking reductions, and it was done in conjunction with a large investment in their um, in their transit system. It was done in conjunction, and I think that's one thing that it, we've given, um, we've created a lot of distrust and, and, on, and sometimes some wanting from, from our citizens because we don't have that infrastructure in place that we promised them will 
will replace the need for cars, but yet we push forward with some of the policy forward. So I think we should um, continue to listen there. I think it'll be really important. Um, I want to thank um, Councilmember Sledge for being as aggressive in pushing this conversation forward that he's had, as well as um, traveling across the country and, and developing best practices and, and, and hearing those and bringing them back. But I'd like to hear from my, my fellow commissioners, but those are some of my opening thoughts. Commissioner Haynes. So, Lisa, talk to us about um, accessible and handicapped parking. Uh, I think the gentleman brought up a good question. I've got a mother-in-law who can barely get around, especially for commercial uses and for large multifamily projects. Sure. So that would be covered by a different portion of the code as it relates to requirements for any sort of accessible or handicapped spots. This would not prohibit those um, spots from being included. And so whether or not a handicapped space is required is per the building code. And so this wouldn't change that. And because of one of the tweaks that we made with the um, memo, um, we're making sure that even the small spaces that um, the smaller spaces are are allowed to have some spaces, and so if they need a handicapped space to meet those um, housing or the I'm sorry the building code requirements, that they are still able to do so. So a multifamily project of a certain size would be required by the building code to have a set number of handicapped parking spaces. Correct. Okay. Correct. And this would and this would not change that. Okay. Um, to Commissioner Henley's point, I, I think Councilman Sledge should be commended for this, but this is the first step. And if we really want to be a progressive, world-class city, we've got to solve mass transit next. Uh, without solving mass transit, I think this becomes you know, a, a Band-Aid and not a true fix. And so if Councilman Sledge wants to tackle mass transit before he leaves office. He's, he's, Thank you, he's got my full support. Commissioner. Well, this has been very interesting. Um, and I, I um, probably have said this before. I've certainly thought it before. Uh, yeah, Commissioner, would you move the mic? There you go. Thank you, sir. I wish that... I was um, able to say something more creative than Councilmember Henley, but I'm, I'm not. He just said everything I was thinking a little bit more carefully and thoughtfully than I would have as someone who supports this concept a lot. I also really <laughs> cannot believe the, the level of discourse, uh, how sophisticated it has been, how thoughtful and, and um, careful it has been. And um, I, can't, I can't help but think that, yes, we might work out a lot of things and get a lot more um, finality in it at council-level debates and further thoughts. I'm sure we, we have a chance to do that. But I've always thought, maybe it's because of my history with the 18th District, that it was best to kind of resolve these things at a more micro level um, instead of people having to come downtown and find a parking place at a council meeting and stuff like that. Um, so I'm, I just think it's both sides made excellent points. There was a fair amount of we're for this, but it's not really what we want completely, and we're going to work on it. Maybe this is the place to work on it more. I don't know. I'm just thinking it might be. So uh, I, um, I really uh, have learned a lot just in the last half hour, um, and and I'm not opposed to the concept at all. I'm not sure I'm ready to vote for it um, because I do believe there's a value in working through some details before it gets to the courthouse. Uh, and most of it has been worked out. I mean, it's not like the councilman hasn't been working on this <laughs> locally, but I'm particularly interested in the comments that we heard from residents who, who have been stellar urban um, neighbors in an urban neighborhood for, for quite some time. So I'll be glad to listen to more folks, but I'm leaning toward thinking we're not quite ready to to endorse, that I'm not quite ready to endorse this. Thank you, Commissioner. Councilman. 
<clears throat> thank you, Chair, and thank you to everyone who came out. Uh, I think it's um, for anyone who might be considering running for council, um, and especially for anyone who might be considering running for council for District 6, um, I think this discussion is really instructive. Um, we have folks who are, really care about our neighborhoods, uh, sometimes who reach different conclusions on things. Um, uh, and there's no one uh, position that you can generically say is true of any neighborhood. Um, and this is the this is sort of the result. What I would like to do for a, a number of the, in particular the Edgefield neighbors who spoke, uh, they were referencing a particular property and a proposal, and I wanted to call on uh, Ms. Milligan, if I can, to uh, address that question with regard to the Tulip Street Methodist Church building. Just as a background, a lot of folks will know it's a historic church building. Um, has the fantastic uh, bell tower. We've been trying to work on fun. the Methodist district closed that church a while back. Since that time, we've been trying to find an adapter for use on it. Uh, Edgefield did work with me to have some community meetings about a potential neighborhood landmark. One of the real challenges with that historic church, as was true of most historic churches, is that they had no parking. So that that's a real challenge for that adaptive reuse. We have had a community meeting on it previously. It's indefinitely deferred for a while. But uh, but I think the question is is a good one. And if I could call on Miss Milligan to speak to how how this might affect that or not. Certainly. So the application that has been filed for that, as you mentioned, is a neighborhood landmark overlay. And neighborhood landmark overlays are are really sort of unique when it when it comes to the type of overlays that we consider. Um, they are um, ones where we really work closely with the community. And the entire purpose of a neighborhood landmark is to take a use that is residentially zoned, that is important to the community. It doesn't have to necessarily be sort of capital H history. Historic, um, but it can just be an important, unique feature that's within the neighborhood, and it's to allow adaptive reuse of that, um, so that the use can be, so that the building can be protected, and so um, it allows sort of a different type of use than would necessarily be permitted under the base zoning, and so they are, like I said, sort of unique. Um, when we're looking at a neighborhood landmark overlay, it is a rezoning, and so that would be a process that comes to the Planning Commission. Several years ago, we actually changed the process um, to make it um, a bit more um, flushed out at the Planning Commission level when the district is established. And so when a neighborhood landmark comes in, we require that a site plan be provided and that it establish the uses that would be permitted. And so with that site plan, we would be looking at um, all of the t sort of operational things, such as traffic, parking, all of those. And the neighborhood landmark specifically states that it permits alternative standards from what the base zoning or from what the zoning code might establish. And so in other words, if the if the zoning code says, this is in the UZO, no parking is, is required, we would actually look at it from a sort of a context and a neighborhood sensitivity standpoint to say, that that may be the case, but we're looking for a context-sensitive solution, and so we could require parking um, as part of working with the community. So we see neighborhood landmarks as being really, it's integral that we're working with the community on those because it's allowing uses that may not otherwise be permitted. So yes, parking um, is certainly part of the discussion with any neighborhood landmark. Well, thank you, Ms. Milligan, and, and I know Abby Rickoff from the planning staff has been working on that one quite a bit, and I believe has had a lot of really good conversation with the neighborhood to date uh, to address those concerns. And, uh, I know that the question was raised about how this would, uh, how the ordinances before us would address that, and I'm not certain whether Ms. Rickoff has had an opportunity to respond just yet, but um, I'll, I'll be happy to work with planning staff to make sure that they get that in an email if they need to because those are, those are handy things sometimes. Um, but so I, I do want to uh, um, push back a little bit on the idea that the East Nashville community hasn't known about this ordinance. 
what I've uh, just in doing a little bit. Number one, like every Monday, I do. A lot of people do a, a, a newsletter. I don't do a newsletter. I do a Monday Facebook post that says this is what's coming up for the next week. This is a link to the agenda for the meeting. These are the district six items that are that are on that agenda. So I do that pretty regularly. Uh, usually every Monday. Sometimes I'll provide other updates on that. Uh, a lot of people kind of know to look to that. Uh, in addition to that, uh, I would note that um, I find that when this item was filed, as far back as September 2nd, the Nashville scene uh, reached out to me as a co-sponsor of it, and I was included in an interview on it on September the 2nd. As is often the case, those things get shared with the East Nashville Facebook page, and lots of discussion ensues. So that goes back to September 2nd. On September 13th, I was interviewed by a local news channel right in Five Points. Again, that was shared. The uh, journalist actually did a great job of reaching out to a local business owner uh, there in the Five Points area as well to get some different perspectives on that. So I would push back a little bit on the idea that the East Nashville community is just learning about this. Um, now, lots of things go on. We're all busy and things like that. But just want to share that that communication has been out there. Um, uh, Mr. Guthrie from the East End Neighborhood Association, um, their group uh, meets every other month. I was able to join their recent uh, neighborhood meeting and discuss both the um, – because uh, they give me a little bit of time to talk about council items, but discuss this item as well as the smart parking plan um, for the East End Neighborhood Association. Of course, the majority of the Five Points area, not exclusively, but the, but the majority of the mixed-use area where we have MUL zoning and things of that nature that supports multifamily uh, in addition to businesses. The majority of that is in the, East, in the East End neighborhood. We had a good discussion about that there. A lot of neighbors in East End. I'm very, very interested in getting more um, parking enforcement because people do park the corners and things like that and creates dangerous situations and uh, kind of ex explain both of these uh, to the neighbors and invited feedback. So um, as it turns out, the Edgefield neighborhood has not had a, a regular business meeting in a little while, and that is the reason why I haven't had an opportunity to meet with them specifically about to, uh, this as part of their usual meetings. Lachlan Springs similarly hasn't had a meeting in a while, but I do feel that, again, with national scene coverage, with local news media coverage, with just regular Facebook discussions, that um, folks are aware of this in District 6 and, and still have opportunities uh, to provide feedback. One of the things I'll point out as well, uh, I think, is from the sort of, uh, I, I like to joke that I'm the only person in, in District 6 who's not an architect, but we have lots of folks that work in that space uh, who are District 6 constituents. Mr. Scott Morton, who's one of my neighbors, you know, right, and pr presented with some, with some interesting information related to what would be the effect be of converting minimums to maximums. And to me, that really is the one item that uh, I, I would want to explore more. I don't know that we uh, have to resolve that necessarily today, um, but it, I think that it is, is something that's worth uh, discussing. Um, I was relieved to see the, uh, the uh, late amendment, I guess we would say, from staff. We do have a lot of small business spaces uh, in um, in East Nashville, in many cases, legacy commercial zoning, going back to before we started down zoning everything, you will have a corner store at a corner way back in the neighborhood, and it has a, a commercial business in it. And if they have less than 1,000 square feet or 2,000, depending on the use, they might not be required to do parking today. I would hate to get into a position where we say you cannot build parking, um, even though that's a desired outcome. And I think that the amendment that we have so far really addresses that really well. Um, but I do think that... Um, converting a minimum to a maximum is uh, is something that probably should be explored a little bit more, uh, and I think maybe especially with folks who work in in that space. Uh, I'm a, a legislator, but not uh, a developer by any means, so I'm interested in how that works out. One uh, example that I will say, and I don't have a lot of study on it, but um, uh, we have a lot of demand for grocery stores in our neighborhoods, and what comes to mind for me is that there's a grocery store that we added uh, a couple of years ago uh, there on Gallatin where you have a tenant that demands a lot of parking and parking in front, right? And so we had to make a decision, you know, do you follow, you know, is it better to have the grocery store uh, in the neighborhood or to follow a, a dogmatic view of uh, building placement in the zoning code? And 
by a wide margin, uh, I would say the, the community that I live in uh, was happy to finally have this grocery store uh, added in our neighborhood after uh, a 10-year wait. So that's just one, one thing that I think that we could maybe think about for some of those uses in particular is uh, what, what would happen if someone has uh, a type of a tenant that really does need a little bit more parking maybe uh, and would... Um, would capping that uh, hinder their ability to, to get that type of a tenant? And really, really, I think about a better grocery store user in particular. But I think that facet also is something that we can continue to, to work on a little bit. This is going to go to council for a public hearing. Really relieved to see the really engaged discussion we've had today. I'm sure we'll have very similar discussion at public hearing and council. But these bills are amendable on third reading, and we can continue to work on any details that come up in this conversation and, and continue to draw on the expertise of staff once we have maybe a little bit more data on that one point, but I would uh, encourage moving ahead today. So, thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Commissioner Johnson. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, everybody uh, who came to spoke and share your thoughts and for awe and concern. I really appreciate your input. And I would like to uh, thank uh, Councilmember Sledge and Henderson and other uh, Council members, uh, co-sponsors, it is hard to introduce uh, something to try to make uh, impact or huge difference. Uh, you know, since uh, Nashville Next, we have been talking about walkability, sustainability, and you know, walkable neighborhood. And if we were try to create uh, those. Uh, community, we have to make policy or legislation decision intentionally create those type of neighborhood. And I think uh, this uh, proposal will do that. Uh, the one thing it does not do, it may look like it's a radical change, but I do not see that as a radical change. You know, we have been requiring minimum parking, and this legislation does is not prohibiting parking, rather just let go of minimum parking requirement. And, you know, if you would remember, I think it was September or August, you know, some downtown residential and hotel development, and since it's a DTC, uh, parking is not required. But uh, that particular development said certain number of parking space uh, that development team comfortable with providing, and that would be the right size and right portion. And I think we will have that kind of discussion even we, if we adopt this legislation, because it is not telling any developer, no, you may not create any parking. And it, instead, it gives option. So each site and property site specific, it will have uh, if development chose to do so, they may still wanted to provide uh, the, uh, parking. But at the same time, you know, if there is, like, like uh, Lisa said, missing middle, uh, some small development they can do without parking, that will give ample opportunity to create those type of uh, development without uh, <coughs> hardship of adding uh, parking cost. And also, if those uh, development are multimodal corridor. Uh, it will further encourage uh, usage of uh, transit. So I think it will go hands in hand, and we have to start with somewhere. So it will be like egg comes first or chicken comes first. So I think this intentional policy is a good direction for the future of you know, Nashville. It's not going to solve a traffic problem. It's not going to solve a spillover currently happening in especially East Nashville and the, you know, uh, uh, Wedge Houston, you know, South Nashville to have South and those uh, you know, commercial and residential mixed use corridor. But it will uh, create uh, the uh, first step towards more walkable community and a sustainable uh, community. So for that spirit, I am for uh, this uh, proposal. One thing I am not 
100% sure is, of course, eliminate minimum is the right way. Uh, to do so, uh, I really appreciate this uh, chart from Smith G Studio because some development tend to overpark. So in that sense, uh, I understand creating maximum is a good idea, but one thing I'm not sure is the formula and what is the right number. So if you would uh, talk to me about that, that would be great. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Blackshear. Oh, wait, it's a question. Yeah. <laughs> Certainly. Um, so we, um, of course, considered the minimums as they are now as the maximums. Um, and what we did in sort of making that determination was look at a lot of um, mixed-use SPs and some recent developments that we've had that have come in where a lot of the times people are asking for the ability to do less based on either shared uses or um, what they have indicated to us is less demand than what is through a parking study than what is required. So right now, sort of if you're not in an SP, if you're just straight zoned and you, um, and so we utilize that for the maximum, the, the minimums, um, based on sort of our knowledge of people are typically trying to do less than what even the minimums are that are required. So right now the process would be if you wanted to do sort of less than what the minimum is required, you go to the BZA and you can ask for a reduction in parking. Um, the same would apply if you want to do more than, if it's set as a maximum, then you could go to the BZA, make your case for why it's appropriate to have more than the minimum. And so we're just sort of reversing the scenario so that you're not having to ask for less, you're having to go to the BZA to ask for more. Thank you. Just want to make sure you're, okay. Thanks, Commissioner. <laughs> Sorry about that. All right. Commissioner Blackshear. All right. Oh, good. It works. Thanks. Um, I do appreciate everyone coming down. Obviously, a lot of um, thought has um, been put into, obviously, the comments from the neighbors, but, of course, the work from the council people are really appreciated. Um, it was interesting to hear the comments. It sounded like the comments for and against were pretty much the same. Um, people thought that a walkable neighborhood area with increased transit would be a good thing, um, and it sounded like most of the comments, even in support of the bill, were not necessarily in support of the bill as written, and it sounded like the comments against the bill weren't completely against the bill, but just against the bill as written. And um, I think Commissioner Clifton made a really good point. If we think the bill is not where it needs to be, and the council person did offer um, the ability to work on the bill to fine tune it before it gets adopted, but if we don't think it's where it needs to be, whether it's appropriate for us to vote on it now. And it, I think I hear some commissioners saying they do think the bill is where it needs to be and they would be comfortable voting for it now, but I'm not sure that um, I fall in that camp. I do appreciate the conversation about um, the maximum amount of parking and, and why that number was chosen. Um, I think it's interesting when we think about places being overparked. Um, I don't, I mean, I'm assuming that when developers build parking spaces, they're doing it because it, it does meet a demand. Um, there are various people who, who come to various places. So you have people maybe who um, obviously are disabled who can't get around, but there are people who have children and taking uh, mass transit with two little ones is not very convenient. You made a great point about having like a grocery store and what the appropriate number of parking spaces for that would be too. So I do think there's a lot of um, nuance to be thought in the bill. And uh, I can't remember who said it, but um, maybe it was one of the, the folks against the bill, but the, um, the limitation of this application to non-residential uses and how that works and how that could be helpful. I'm very empathetic to the neighbors who are saying, we live in an area where people will park, and it may not be people coming in from Davidson County, it may be people from Wilson County who are going to come in and park, and they're not going to use WeGo, and they're going to basically take over the area in our neighborhood that we would use or could be used or would make it otherwise um, 
neighborhood friendly. So I, I think the bill is a nice bill. I do think that I would be supportive of it at some point. I'm not quite sure that I'm at the point where I would be supportive of it now. Um, I would be fine with the deferral if other folks thought that the um, the bill was in a place where they would be supportive of it now. Then I, I mean, I, I would not I would not block the vote, but I just would not be able to vote in favor of it right now. Thank you, Vice Chair. Am I on? <laughs> um, thank you. That was yeah, very interesting. I mean, I think similar to a lot of the commenters, um, I certainly support the intent um, and, and the goals of putting this in place. Um, you know, obviously this is where we want to see our city going. We do want to see a reduction in reliance on automobile to get autos to get around. Um, and we want to really, you know, take steps that we can to um, promote uh, mass transit as best we can. Um, I do have to ask a clarifying question, and, and it seems really dumb, but this does apply to any property in the UZO? That, well, with the exception of SPs that have been approved that indicate that they were based on UZO parking standards, the UZO standard would still be a minimum for those that are within an SP. Um, uh, Logan, I wonder if you could go and pull up the map, the, go back a few slides, keep going. Um, there, stop there. So the part that's outlined in black is the UZO. Properties that are along those sort of very um, dark, bold lines are already exempt based on a previous, and that's where probably I'd say the majority of commercial and non-residential are located on those corridors. That's where you've got Gallatin Pike and those sorts of things, um, and so it's already exempted there. So yes, it would apply to everything else that's outside of ones that were they're not already exempted. There are also already some exemptions within the UZO based on um, size. So in other words, retail, 2,000 square feet is exempt from having to have any parking. Restaurants, a thousand square feet is exempt from having to have any parking. And so some of the sort of smaller uh, non-residential uses that you typically find closer into neighborhoods are already exempt. So, so this would cover the everything corridors else. corridors are currently exempt from parking requirements. Yes. Okay. I mean, I do think when we hear that one of the, the goals is to try to really um, encourage development of missing middle housing, and one of the ways to increase affordability is to take out the requirement that they have to provide parking, that to me does bring up the question of should we be thinking about this at least as a starting point just for residential projects and then think about commercial separately. So I am lived in Edgefield. I'm very sensitive to the fact that you can't leave your house and expect to come back on a Sunday afternoon um, if there's the Titans game here. And that's fine. You know, we made that decision when we moved there. We knew that it, but it's hard. So the idea of, you know, having that happen more often is is certainly something I would want to consider. Um, I also I live in in Lachlan Springs now, and we have very very busy c commercial corners, and um, you know I know you're familiar with this as well. Um, but you know, weekend nights is getting kind of dangerous because people aren't seeing the stop signs. There's cars that are parked all the way up to the stop sign. Um, you know, I, I'm noted to Councilman Withers, the WeGo bus can't get down 16th Street in, in the evenings because there's cars parked on both sides. So I do have to think that maybe we need to think about those commercial uses if they are in these primarily residential areas differently. And I would be comfortable. Um, oh, and the other thing, and I read this in the staff report, um, you know, I think that the idea of the parking permits makes a lot of sense. I grew up in a city that had probably some of the very first residential parking permits, and we did it because we had a big hospital in the neighborhood, and we had to deal with the fact that all the hospital people wanted to park in. And so we got parking permits, and it was a pain, but it made a difference, and it allowed residents. So I also would think that we would want to... Make, I don't know how active and how easy it is to get those parking permit programs in place, but I would think that we'd want to see that kind of move along on a parallel tract, at least to see if that's accessible. Um, I mean, I guess you can speak to that. How easy, like if Edgefield wants to go get parking permits, 
Um, so there are currently some streets in Edgefield that already have residential parking um, residential parking permits, um, and so that is an option. I mean, that's a, a program right now that um, a community can work with their council member to apply to NDOT to actually have the parking permit. So that's something that exists, and there is some residential uh, permit parking. I know particularly around Sky Blue on those streets. There's some residential on Russell Street. Um, there is already some residential permit parking as well. Um, so that is an existing program. Um, thank you, uh, Diana. Um, so just to follow up, though, on your previous question, so there were three issues that you mentioned. One, um, I think, where we're talking about on-street parking speaks somewhat to right-of-way management and how we balance uses where you have high-capacity bus service or we want high-capacity bus service with other types of functions. And so I think, I think that that's a good point. I would put it in a slightly different um, category and, you know, you, you sort of want to assume, again, that those blue lines represent where that bus service is likely to go. Um, and so I think if there needs to be a different right-of-way management program for the area you're describing, that's something we should talk with NDOT and we go um, about. And then I think, Lisa, if you could just restate again the BZA process, because part of part of what we think about as planners is how to accomplish the city that we want to live in. And it's interesting. We all sort of agree on a lot of the principles we were talking about, and we want our processes to reflect that. So you want the burden to be on uh, decisions that we we want to reduce parking, right? And so you, you want the burden to be on entities that want to uh, have more parking, right? And so, but today, it's sort of reversed, right? And so I think, Lisa, if you can talk through what that process looks like, again, just to reassure the commission that there's a process for getting more parking and how that's different from what we have today. Certainly. So right now, um, of course, we have minimum parking requirements within the UZO. Um, if you want to do less, um, then you can go to the BZA to ask for a variant to reduce the amount of parking. Um, and the, the burden is then on, of course, whoever's providing the parking to prove that the parking is not needed. Typically, they would have to do a, a parking study or um, sort of a use share study to show what the demand is um, for the parking to be able to have a reduction. A lot of the times, we actually see affordable housing developments that come in and ask for reduction in parking um, because they don't want to build parking that is not needed. Um, and so a lot of times that burden would be to, to ask for a reduction. Um, Likewise, so we're sort of flipping the equation. Um, if you, if we set a parking maximum and you uh, are um, allowed to have 100 spaces, but you would like to have 125 spaces, then you could go to the BZA to ask for a variance to permit you to have additional, and then you would, you know, provide your um, data to the BZA for why you need to provide additional over what is. Um, the, the the amount required. I mean, I think this all. Okay. I I think this all makes a tremendous amount of sense, and I um, fully fully support the idea that we would um, eliminate the parking requirements for affordable multifamily housing um, or for affordable housing period. Um, I think I am falling in the camp of Commissioner Blackshear and Commissioner Clifton that I might be inclined to seek a deferral because I would like to give some thought to whether we do want to paint such a broad brush and whether we do want to consider if there's anything different for those non-residential areas that are not on the corridors. Okay. Any, any other questions, Commissioner? So we're kind of all over the board. I, I, um, <laughs> I personally, uh, not really for a deferral, um, but it's not my decision as chair. So uh, I'm kind of leaning towards the councilman. And um, I feel like the only, after listening to the BZA as a back, 
kind of as another process and also having parking permits as an existing um, process that we already do in neighborhoods. Um, to me, it seems like the only question left is, well, the vice chair had some other questions maybe on um, as well, but um, it seemed like the parking maximums were the one thing left. And I guess the question is, is if we do move it forward or would that make it come, if we change that portion, director, or maybe our legal staff, would that have to come back? I guess I'm asking more of a procedural question. Would that come back to us or is that considered a non-substantial issue? Thank you. So when we have zoning bills for, say, a single property, the rules are really clear about when um, those go to council and if those change, what gets re-referred back to the commission. What I will say is that for text amendments, which tend to have citywide implications, tend to be more complex. We have historically given council, or our expectation is that there might be some adjustments made, and the council members have even expressed that. And so um, it's a little bit of a different analysis. And generally, if I have found that the um, that the proposals have gotten a lot larger, or they sub substantially changed, or there are new provisions, we would recommend that that come back to the Planning Commission. I think it would be appropriate, given the discussion, that if council members or council were to entertain um, sort of modest changes, for example, to the maximums, I even heard that that's something that they're interested in, then, you know, I'm, I would not recommend that that come back to the Planning Commission because of sort of the technical nature of this, although I'm committed to continuing to work with the council and to avail them of the planning staff as well, and I'm sure NDOT as well. So I would just say I'm putting that on the record, if you do move it forward, that my advice would be that we generally support some leeway there, uh, particularly on the maximums, which seem to be where there's um, greater interest. And obviously, if they um, make the proposal more restrictive than general Generally that wouldn't come back at all. So, Lisa, did you agree or disagree with any of that that you want to clarify? I agree. Perfect. <laughs> uh, any other questions, Councilman? Uh, thank you, Chair. Just want to reiterate, um, uh, Councilmember Sled just referenced it, and I think one of the members of the uh, the public has referenced it, that um, NDOT has actually been working on a uh, right-of-way management program for since December of last year, and uh, that's been vetted through the Traffic and Parking Commission. Uh, it's been through a procurement. There was a procurement challenge, which d delayed it a little bit later than Director Alicorn would have liked, but it, that has been upheld. It's back on track. Um, the or I believe that's on third reading. Yeah, it was on third reading. We had um, lots of eyes on it. Uh, some of the council members discovered a couple of really, really minor tweaks, which says that they have read it thoroughly. Some of our really analytical council members have read it very, very thoroughly. And uh, in response to that, uh, Council Member Henderson has worked very, very diligently with staff to address those very, very minor tweaks to it. But I know Director Alicon is excited to get that out, um, which will add staffing uh, so that the vendor can work on adding staffing, Metro can work on procuring you know, equipment and all those things to do it. But one of the real benefits to me, I, I don't know that Councilmember Cash is still here, but um, Vice Chair Farad referenced living near a hospital and by, I think by a wide, I know my East National neighbors get frustrated, but by a wide margin, the largest generator of on-street parking appears to be Vanderbilt University and Hospital. Um, and so that is something that was really, really important, I know, to Councilmember Cash is to make sure that if we were working working toward, forward on this, that there be at least light at the end of the tunnel of when we might be able to get a functioning um, residential permit parking program. The one we have right now is sort of you, you go down to the office and they photocopy something for you. But uh, I think for neighbors, that's a little bit frustrating. But, but to uh, get a better program as well as with staffing to help with that enforcement. 
And I think once those things are in place, which I would think would be, I mean, it'd be a few months, but not uh, uh, not a long ways off. Uh, but once that's in place, uh, NDOT can continue to work with the neighborhoods uh, themselves and council members to see, you know, if, if we needed to make that a little bit more of a streamlined process, we, we certainly could. One of the things we do have, I will say, and I don't want to go on for a long time, but one of the things that we have right now in Nashville, because I do have, uh, and I have worked with, uh, Russell Street neighbors in particular uh, to apply residential permit parking is right now it is sort of like there's these two blocks and then there's these two blocks and these two and these you know so I think ultimately what we will get to uh, in Nashville and probably not too long and maybe actually this will help give us an impetus to do that but it, most cities that have residential permit parking it's for like a square mile area so that you have staff that can can be deployed efficiently to make sure that those uh, are in place rather than this this block and this block and this block and that block so I, but but at the same time we do have legislation that is on third reading on uh, Tuesday's meeting that will uh, begin a procurement uh, so there is light at the end of the tunnel for that we do have a good process in place to continue to revisit the right-of-way management with the traffic and parking commission and other bodies so I think that a lot of those concerns We'll be, uh, we'll be in a position to address those concerns before we're going to have significant numbers of developments that actually uh, apply the pressure, I believe. And uh, I really appreciate the response about uh, from staff about the, the appeal process for what if you do have a tenant that, that demands more parking for whatever reason, is there a remedy for that? And I'm, I'm satisfied that there is. So I'm comfortable working with my colleagues to continue to move this forward today. Thank you, Councilman. So we're we're uh, still on discussion uh, since we have opposite comments. We can try to do a vote if somebody wants to make a motion. Does somebody want to make a motion or more discussion, Commissioner Henley? You have a I have a comment, but then I'm I would like to make a motion. Well, it's proper to to discuss and make a comment. Yeah. But it's proper. Uh, well, I think my comment is you know I think. We're at a moment where we have uh, opportunity to simultaneously take a pretty significant step forward in, in terms of what we believe we want our city to be um, w w with this vote. And I think, too, we also have the opportunity to really build confidence in our community. I think we have the opportunity to further leverage Hub Nashville, which is something we champion, um, utilize technology. I mean, you have QR codes and scanning and things. I mean, we hopefully will have some legislation that will pass. We'll put human bodies, you know, into these communities to help take care of the wider way. Um, I always... I've become a broken record, but time and time again, you know, the community comes here and we're making policy and 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 we're making, you know, recommendations about private property and things that impact private property, but most often they're frustrated because the public realm is what's failing them over and over again, and this is, seems to be the same case. It's the right-of-way. Um, it's not necessarily specifically what, what happens on private property. So uh, with all that being said, I would like to make a motion that we would accept uh, staff recommendation. Uh, I think there's been a lot of uh, commitments from our uh, elected officials to continue to work with the community um, to make sure we do a better job of getting this right. And so I would like to move forward with that recommendation. So the recommendation would be to approve the substitute by the staff? Yes. All right, it's a proper motion, is it? And there's a second. Any other discussion? Yeah, I'm opposed. Oh. <laughs> Commissioner. I have to oppose that in light of um, what all the comments have been around the table um, before the motion. Um, it seems to me that there's um, a desire to move this on, even though at a at this level there there are ways to bring about more understanding from pe people, um, more consensus building, and um, frankly, it's it's almost frustrating to think that we had a decided majority of people who were not prepared to vote for this until until discussion that still doesn't get to the basic problem of there may be ways we can improve it at this level if there can be more process with some of the people who are now engaged. So I, I cannot support that. That's all I'm saying. Thank you. Any other discussion? Because we're on discussion. I'll make sure I get to everybody. All right. All right, so uh, status is we've had a proper motion and a second. Uh, 
And seeing no other discussion, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. No. Ayes have it. Well, let's do by hand. Let's make sure so we get our record. So all in favor say aye. Ayes have it. Five ayes, three notes. All right. Oh, no. We don't clap. No, we don't. Um, all right. And so the substitute moves forward. And, Councilman, I do, I, I want to preface this as there has been some contention on the commission. And so our normal process is if it changes significantly in the council, I think it needs to definitely come back here. Now, if it's some minor adjustments, and I know we've done this many a time, but I trust you. We've worked with you and, and Council Lady Henderson a lot uh, in the council, and we have a good relationship. So I trust you, and so I just want to preface that. Um, and and there, I, I don't want my good commissioners to feel frustrated and that we're trying to move it move it forward too fast. So, um, so we're at commissioners. We've only considered one item. <laughs> we, it was a very important item, um, but we've been here two and a half hours. I mean, I, I think, um, a restroom. a restroom break would be, uh, so why don't we, if all the commissioners agree, we'll, we'll take a brief 10, 10 minute break. Thank you. Um, thank you for letting us have a small break. Uh, we really appreciate that, and I appreciate your patience. And um, sometimes you never know that you're going to be here for a couple hours talking about getting rid of parking spots. But we take this very seriously, so we appreciate you guys waiting on us. All right, so we finished item eight, and that means we are on... Item 17, but I want to see sometimes uh, folks leave if the item is supposed to be on the consent agenda. And so on item number 17, which is 12th Avenue South SP, is there anyone in the room opposing it? I want to make sure. All right, Commissioner, so our option is we can put this back on the consent agenda as it was on the consent agenda. And is there a motion to put it back on the consent agenda? It's proper motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor of putting item 17 back onto the consent agenda, thus approving that item, say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Ayes have it. So item 17 has passed on the consent agenda. Wow, that's fast. All right, so now we are on to... We had to get rolling. We had to get rolling. We're just getting warmed up. Um, so now that brings us to item 20. Logan, are you going to do the presentation? Yes, Chair. All right, go ahead. I will. And my name is Logan Elliott with the Planning Department. I'll be presenting item 20 on tonight's agenda. Here we go. And you will see a memo that staff has provided that is uh, clarifying the traffic and parking conditions on the application. NDOT provided updated conditions on this application after having additional discussions with Council Member Hauser and other constituents. And the main crux of these updates include a condition that access shall be limited to US 70 South. So the site plan that we'll see today will show access onto the adjacent street Harpeth. Uh, Valley Road, but NDOT is uh, suggesting or recommending a condition that access be limited to US 70 only, and otherwise there's some minor technical updates to their comments. Um, so getting into the presentation and the request, the request is to rezone to SP zoning to permit a hospital land use, and staff is recommending approval of conditions and disapproval without all conditions. The the site currently has SP zoning applied to it, and this zoning permits a financial institution and a restaurant land use with surface parking. The restaurant land use had begun construction and was halted partially through, and that building has since been removed, so the site is currently vacant. Uh, the site has had commercial entitlements through a planned unit development overlay and subsequently through SP zoning since at least 1985. And the site was previously developed with a commercial landscaping business. 
Uh, another note on the history of the site is that the policy was revised after the 2010 flood uh, impacted this area. Staff did not support the SP zoning in 2010 because of floodplain concerns in the recent aftermath of the 2010 flood. And the current SP zoning that was applied in 2015 was supported by staff as well as the Planning Commission as the SP zoning was found to bring the entitlements of the site further into compliance with the policy uh, by reducing the development intensity and the amount of impervious surface on the site. Um, so looking at the policy applied to the site, it is rural maintenance with conservation policy. Uh, the rural maintenance intends to maintain rural character as a permanent choice for living within Davidson County, and rural maintenance areas have established low-density residential, agricultural, and institutional development patterns. Um, the conservation policy applied to the site reflects the floodplain that exists on the site. Uh, the site has areas within the 100-year floodplain, and the entire site is within the 500-year floodplain. Uh, to the rear of the site and further down Harpeth Valley Road is suburban neighborhood maintenance policy that is applied to a residential subdivision with the RS-40 zoning. And a direct, directly across the site to the east, across Harpeth Valley Road, is a small-scale office park with office limited zoning that is in a similar situation where their zoning entitlements are uh, inconsistent with the underlying policy after, they were, after the policy updates of uh, 2010. So looking at the proposed site plan, again, access is shown on the Harpeth Valley Road here and US 70 and NDOT's uh, recommending that access be limited to Highway 70 and, and planning staff supports that recommendation. Uh, US uh, Highway 70 is a scenic arterial in the Major and Collector Street plan, so that means a landscape buffer is required along the street. Uh, the site's approximately 3.42 acres, um, and on the site they're proposing an approximately 10,000 square foot single story medical office building with surface parking in front. Um, an ambulance drive wraps the building with an ambulance canopy to the rear of the building, and additionally, a, a canopy is provided at the front of the building where the primary entrance is. And otherwise, the rear of the site, approximately 150 feet of the site, will contain stormwater facilities and will have a buffering area that's left in its natural condition. Looking at some language in the policy that helped guided staff in this uh, somewhat unusual situation, uh, both the conservation policy and the rural maintenance policy describe that in situations where the current zoning has the potential to develop in ways inconsistent with the policy, that these situations may warrant supporting a district that's otherwise considered inappropriate if it brings the development potential closer to conforming or in line with the guidance of the policy. So one thing that staff requested of this applicant was to demonstrate how their proposal would be bringing the, the zoning of the site further into compliance with the policy goals of the area. So this included looking at the impervious surface on the site, which is being reduced from 51% to 37% of the site. And additionally, the anticipated traffic generation is about half of what the existing zoning would be anticipated to generate. So considering the existing zoning entitlement, staff finds the proposed SP to bring the, the zoning further into compliance with both the conservation policy, as it's more sensitive to the floodplain that's on the site, and additionally reduces the intensity of the site, and therefore is more in compliance with the rural maintenance policy. Um, that completes my presentation. I'm here to answer any questions you have. Thank you, Logan. Appreciate that. And so now we'll, commissioners, we'll open this item for public hearing. Is the applicant in the room? Come on up, Mr. White. And you have 10 minutes, and you can save two of the 10 minutes for rebuttal. You're recognized. Mr. Chairman, members of the commission, my name is Tom White, 511th Avenue North. I represent the applicant and requesting the two minutes for rebuttal. At the front end, I want to thank... Council Lady Hauser for the unbelievable amount of time she's taken on this matter, both in meetings uh, and in correspondence. She's really had a true commitment to what's best for the community. 
I also want to recognize that Reagan Smith is here, who's the engineer on the project. This is an unusual situation for the Planning Commission, where you're going from one SP to another, somewhat unusual, so juxtapose the current SP to what's being proposed. As the staff just commented, basically, the traffic at the site goes from half to maybe two-thirds of what's allowed right now. Secondly, with respect to the impervious surface area, it goes from 51% to 37%. Uh, in addition, it bolsters the conservation policy for the area, and as the staff has recommended, NDOT has come back and said that they would support really one entrance way, and that's on Highway 70. My client supported the proposal that had both. Uh, now they're down to Highway 70. They support that as well. We can show that drawing to the commission. But we thank the commission for your time. We're asking for your approval, but there's not a policy issue here. Uh, it's recommended for approval. Uh, we add that approval being done today. We appreciate your courtesies. We'll stick with our 10 minutes. We'll do two in rebuttal, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your courtesies. <clears throat> Thank you, and uh, we'll save two minutes for your rebuttal. And then, Council Lady, just an explanation. Just you'll go at the very end. Okay, we'll save your your spot for that. Okay. So now we're on to anyone wishing to speak in favor. Come on up, Council Lady. Welcome. It's good to see so many familiar faces. Um, I'm Sherry Weiner. I was the District 22 Council Member before Gloria. I live at 208 Aspenwood Lane. A lot of my comments have been shared with you, and to uh, keep you from having to listen to all of that, I'll um, reduce my comments so that everything that you hear is pertinent. Um, I actually speak as the sponsor of that 2015 SP that the neighbors did support when we put that through, and I'm typically that the new SP that you have before you is certainly, you know, reducing the footprint, increasing the green space, and becoming more in line with what the code is today. I have attended three meetings and had personal calls, visits, and emails, um, some hotly contested and some not, um, but mostly good conversation, good discussion, and good learning opportunity for everybody that's for it and against it. Um, I was asked to advocate um, on behalf of the neighbors with Councilmember Hauser when we went to see NDOT, and that is when we were able to secure the elimination of the entry on and off of Harpeth Valley Road because it really was inappropriate and we're just delighted that they were able to support us in that way. The proposed SP does reflect that one entry and exit, increasing the green space and reducing the building size, the traffic, and importantly, the number of patrons. It's not a hospital. It's not in the middle of our neighborhood. It's in front of our neighborhood and it's an emergency department and one that I've would bet there are people in this room who could most certainly benefit from it um, if, God forbid, something happens. I know when my father-in-law had his heart attack and died on the way to Vanderbilt, I can't tell you whether it would have helped him or not, um, but I can say that I would love that others might have the opportunity that he did not have the opportunity to unveil himself of. Um, I would encourage you to support this, and I really appreciate the time. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Welcome. Good evening, council members. Uh, my name is Scott Seahack. I'm the president and CEO at TriStar Centennial Medical Center. Um, I live at 9602 Romano Way in Brentwood, Tennessee. Um, as I've been a CEO now at uh, TriStar Centennial for the last six years, um, have continued to watch our communities grow. Certainly, uh, Bellevue is a very vibrant uh, community. Uh, more businesses there, more residents growing. Uh, currently, there's no emergency uh, services in the area, so the residents have to go. Uh, down to a downtown hospital. Uh, we have several downtown hospitals, but over the years, um, those hospitals are experiencing a much higher demand. Um, we anticipate this year there'll be about 315,000 emergency department visits um, in the downtown hospitals. Um, and as a result of all those visits, you have uh, at times increased wait times. There's an increased uh, demand on those capacity of beds. Um, this proposal and project allows us to bring uh, a 
fully licensed, accredited emergency department uh, to the Bellevue community. Um, it has 12 treatment bays and has um, will be a satellite campus of TriStar Centennial Medical Center. What that means is all of the subspecialists, all of the physicians, all of the staff of Centennial um, are able to provide services. It allows residents that need emergency care that's life-saving. It allows them very quick access uh, to this emergency department for life-saving, stabilizing care. Um, it also allows uh, fire rescue to have a local emergency department um, and allows that fire rescue unit to get back uh, to the fire station and allows them to respond faster uh, to 911 uh, calls. So I really appreciate um, you know, your consideration of this. Uh, TriStar Centennial uh, is a nationally recognized top 100 hospital. We've been serving communities uh, since 1968, and we are currently a, a 10 uh, consecutive year leapfrog a rated uh, patient safety uh, hospital, and we'll bring all of that quality of care uh, to Bellevue. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. <clears throat> Michael Hasty, 6104 Gardendale Drive, Nashville. Uh, I'm the medical director of TriStar Centennial Emergency Department. I'm also a lifelong Nashvilleian who spent much of his life in and around Bellevue. Over the last 50 years, Bellevue has grown from a small community in the southwest corner of the county into a thriving, growing area with tens of thousands of new residents. There are new nursing homes, retirement communities, daycare centers, subdivisions, new resident or new restaurants, grocery stores, new ice rink, and Bellevue is even getting their high school back. And all of this growth lacks one key to survival, and that's rapid access to emergency care. What we're proposing is not an urgent care. It's a fully functional emergency department like you'd find in a full-size hospital. It'll be staffed 24-7 by board-certified, residency-trained emergency physicians, and this will be in Bellevue, where the people live and work. I've been practicing emergency medicine in Nashville for the past 18 years, and I can't tell you how many tragic cases of if only they'd gotten there sooner we've seen. I've also seen cardiac arrest patients walk out of the hospital because they got to the ER quickly. There's so many medical emergencies where every minute counts, strokes, heart attacks, sepsis, asthma. Putting access to this care in Bellevue will save lives. It will allow Nashville Fire to get Bellevue residents the care they need sooner and will get them back on the streets to care for the next emergency. There are a lot of misconceptions about what the effects of this ER will have on the community. It will not bring crime or violence to the community. It will not increase drug seekers flocking to the area. It will not create noise from EMS. And it will not increase homelessness in the area. I'm happy to explain all of those and clear them up. But what I can tell you is this. The people of Bellevue deserve access to emergency care in their community, which they have not had during my lifetime. This will save lives, and it will give them that care. I ask that the committee approve this zoning change. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak in support? Come on up. Welcome. Thank you. My name is Mary Harden. I live at 8036 Pine Forest Drive. Um, I live in the neighborhood where the um, freestanding ER will go in, and I'm speaking in support. Uh, this ER will be at the entrance of my neighborhood where there uh, is and has been for years an eyesore that detracts from the beauty of where I live, and it keeps people from wanting to buy the homes in our neighborhood. Uh, Bellevue has one ambulance, from what I understand. Um, the woman next to me, um, died by the time an ambulance got there. I mean, we don't know if they could have if they could have helped her. She was not an older lady because she was close to my age and I don't consider myself older yet. Um, we need these emergency services. I don't like to go in public and talk about this. I'm a breast cancer survivor, okay? Um, I'm going to try to, you know, keep myself from getting too emotional. But I still have conditions from all the chemotherapy and all the surgeries that I've gone through, and it makes um, emergency room visits um, a regular occurrence for me. And uh, so um, these minutes matter to me. My neighbors and friends in Bellevue, um, dozens of them, 
want this ER. Um, I must hang out with a lot of old people because most of them honestly couldn't drive in the dark or um, come to this meeting. Some of them I know wrote you all letters. They're people who have heart conditions. They're, they're, they're people who have all kinds of conditions that we know all we need is just to be able to get to some kind of emergency facility beyond a dock in the box at, at Walgreens, right? So we could get stabilized, so we could get all the way to a hospital. I mean, I live in Bellevue. I don't live in the middle of nowhere. I have the beauty of the nature all around me, but yet I still deserve to have basic essential services, okay? That's basically it. If you will support it, please. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, Chairman, uh, my name is Steve Harden, and I live at 8036 Pine Forest Drive, Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, I'm speaking in support of building the freestanding uh, emergency room at the corner of Highway 70 and Harpeth Valley Road. Uh, I'm a teacher here in Nashville. I've been living in Bellevue for over 20 years. This proposed ER will be basically just right in front of my neighborhood. Uh, this spring, I had a, a medical incident where my blood pressure really spry, spiked. They thought I was having some sort of heart condition. My brother-in-law had to drive in from town to take me to the closest ER at St. Thomas West. That was like 45 minutes before I could see anyone with all that driving. That is way too long for me to be receiving, the wait to receive critical care. I would feel much safer living and having an ER at the entrance of my own neighborhood. Uh, it would allow me and my wife to stay and live where we are uh, as we, you know, eventually age and become old, which we're not yet. So I would uh, urge you to, you know, uh, to, to, to support this. Uh, Thank you. Anyone else? Welcome. Thank you. Uh, my name's Jim Dyes. I live at 623 Barland Drive in Bellevue. Uh, my office is at 7516 Highway 70 South. So I live and work in Bellevue. Um, I support the, the emergency room facility to be built in Bellevue and as a heart attack survivor myself, having this facility will provide needed service to the residents of Bellevue and the surrounding communities. Um, I know personally um, having, having a, um, an ER close by is important and you know I'm not um, I guess immune to having another heart attack. And so um, I was fortunate to uh, survive one. Most people don't, and um, that's, you know, the statistics are, are against you in having heart attacks. So um, I would appreciate a facility uh, since I work there and live there as well. Uh, my wife lives and works in Bellevue, um, so we're both um, invested in the community. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak in support? Come on up. <clears throat> Thank you for letting me speak. Uh, my name is Terry Forth, and I live at 1068 General George Patton Road in Bellevue. Um, I'm here in support of the ER. I've lived there for over 27 years. I live in Section 6. I'm also president of the HOA. And a lot of my neighbors and friends are in support of this ER. We don't have anything out there. And we've got a tremendous amount of elderly folks. We've got a lot of new families with children. And I really would like to see that so that we have access in our area. Appreciate your support. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak in support? Make sure we get everybody. One last time. Nope. All right, anyone wishing to speak in opposition? Welcome. Hi, thank you for uh, allowing us to speak today. My name is Kelly Cormos. I live at 7613 Indian Springs in the Bellevue Manor neighborhood that does, um, is adjoining to this parcel. And 
I think a lot of I mean, everyone in our neighborhood, um, there are a lot of mixed feelings, but there are no um, feelings against Bellevue having this type of. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I got nervous. I'm speaking at the wrong time. Yeah, hey. I'm so sorry. Oh, no, this no, you're in opposition. Okay. Yeah, starter. I'm, I'm a little nervous. Oh, starter, okay. starter over there. Okay. We, we don't don't no, be nervous. Okay. We're we don't we're good we're good people regardless of what most people think. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> Um, so there is, no, there is no one in these conversations that does not think that Bellevue deserves this care and that we have the need. What our concerns are is the location. And the reason we're coming to planning is to talk about this location. I did um, bring some sheets, but you all should have had an email as well that shows you um, visual representation of this, par of this parcel, Highway 70, and the topography from there between the new high school that's going to come with um, many, many teenage drivers. Um, so you're going to have teenage drivers, you're going to have distressed drivers, because no one coming to this emergency room is coming um, besides the staff um, that is not in duress. So we have a lot of concerns with the traffic there and how that the safety of all of us getting our kids to school, getting to work, um, and then just... You know, as a parent there, I know that there's a lot of conversation about with our neighborhood having one entrance and exit, and, and we already do have, um, you know, some, some concerns with people when they leave there not having anywhere to go, um, that our neighborhood will become that location for them. And my kids, they ride their bikes, they go to their friend's house, and I'm just, there's a lot of safety issues from a traffic standpoint and just a family standpoint as well. So thank you so much. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak in opposition? Come on up. We're getting the documents up here. Okay, go ahead. Hello, my name is Danielle Ontiveros. The address is 2390 Bellevue Manor Drive. So the property that we have is along this proposed uh, facility. And just like the lady before had mentioned, we're not against Bellevue having an ER, it's a wonderful idea. However, um, if anyone has ever been to a TriStar ER, you definitely don't want to be there after dark. Um, full of people, um, houseless people, um, addicts. I know many medical workers in the ERs, and that's a concern. Uh, people come to seek shelter from the elements. Um, they also come trying to get pain medication. And um, medical workers deal with that. And that's the environment around most ERs, but it's specifically TriStar Centennial, and this is supposed to be like that ER. Um, so I'm concerned about our safety and our land adjoining this um, property. Um, for a lot of reasons, light pollution, noise pollution, traffic, um, but also the people that are just going to come there and hang out trying to seek shelter and pay medication and what our neighborhood's going to become for the families that live there and who's going to just decide to camp on our land. Um, it's not a great... It's not a great um, situation. The reason we purchased this land was because of the fact that it was a rural land. We have some um, extra land that is greenbelt, so for um, protection of wildlife and provide habitat. I know HCA is not concerned about that, but um, this is a very unique neighborhood that is full of families and elderly people. Um, it's a great, quiet neighborhood, which is exactly why we purchased there. Um, I've lived in Los Angeles. And New Orleans, places that are uh, very unsafe, and I don't want this neighborhood to become that way. So I'm against this location. And thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak in opposition? Come on up. Welcome. And commissioners and uh, I am Roy Allen. I live at 2390 Bellevue Manor Drive. Also, that was my wife uh, that just spoke, and uh, we purchased 22 acres. Uh, not far from the site where they proposed. First of all, I am uh, against it. <laughs> uh, we live, uh, we purchased 22 acres not far from uh, where the site is proposed uh, because it was a great, uh, peaceful area at the time. And I'm surprised my wife didn't mention because she's a California girl and she told me to make sure that I mentioned or else not come home tonight is that she loves the animals that are there. Uh, we have Green Bay Belt area and we have deer, foxes, and all of the stuff that she loves. But uh, the reason I'm here is to 
uh, address the fact that there are also, I, I've heard a couple of times that there are older people who want this and who are uh, unable to come out tonight. Uh, by the same token, there are a lot of uh, uh, older people or elderly people who don't want this who also can come, can come out tonight uh, that I've also spoken with. The unfortunate thing is that a lot of those people are apathetic. Uh, when they talk about politics, they say, hey, there's nothing we can do, so you know, why waste your time doing it? Uh, that's very unfortunate. Um, so I'm one of the people that's willing to stand up and speak for uh, that group of people. There are elderly people in the neighborhood right a few, a few feet from where that uh, facility uh, will possibly be built that are absolutely opposed to it. Uh, another thing I'd like to address is that this is unprecedented to have an emergency room uh, basically in a neighborhood. I mean, it's at the front of the neighborhood, but it's bas basically in a neighborhood uh, in Nashville, Tennessee. And if I'm wrong, I, I, I would uh, uh, think or hope that somebody would correct me. I don't think we have anything like this. Uh, and we don't want, definitely don't want our neighborhood to be a uh, guinea pig uh, for that. Uh, am I out of time? Yes, sir. Two minutes goes by fast when you're having fun. It goes by very fast. I didn't cover anything. That I thank to you cover. for coming. All right, thank you. Appreciate it. Mm -hmm. All right, anyone else? Come on up. Good evening, y'all. Thanks for having me. Lynn Edwards. I live at 7512 Potomac Drive inside of the neighborhood in question. And, um, uh, Commissioner Hensley mentioned that um, a lot of times you guys have disputes about private land, but how it affects public property. And in this case, we're not arguing, at least I'm not arguing, that this is not not a good idea for the community. I think this would be a great idea for the community. But this location presents a lot of problems. When the SV was in initially granted in 15 or 14, whenever it was, that was before this new high school is going to be built, okay? So we're about to have this influx of traffic. Uh, from the high school that's going to, I, and I don't know that we've done enough study to determine exactly how that's going to look. Now they say that traffic is, is considerably less under the new and planned SP, but the conditions have changed since then, so I'd like to I'd like to make sure that we've done the due diligence to discuss exactly what this area is going to look like right off of the exit of the interstate, mind you, um, with no traffic light from the entrance and exit uh, from our neighborhood within shouting distance of this brand new giant high school um, that also plans to serve our community. Um, I'm excited to see how this progresses, but I also am very 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 concerned as a resident of Bellevue and having lived in the neighborhood for 11 years now, um, I have giant concerns. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Come on up. My name is Daniel Espenson, individual. I live at uh, 7741 Indian Springs Drive. Thank you, Chairman and members of the Commission, for your service to the community. And thank you for hearing uh, individual residents like us on issues like these that um, directly and significantly impact us every day and every night. Um, you know, these are our homes. This is where we, where we live. There's no place that is more important. Um, there's no place where it's more important, and maybe it's the only place sometimes that we can, but you know, no place that's more important to feel um, and know that we, and especially our families, are safe. And this proposal threatens that safety. Um, we know that violent crime in hospitals has risen considerably in recent years. Uh, the International Association for Healthcare Security and Safety's Crime Survey found a 47% increase in violent crime in 2021 or 2022. A 2022 survey by the American College of Emergency Physicians found that 85% of emergency room physicians believe that the rate of violence experienced in emergency departments has increased over the past five years. Um, that same survey shows that psychiatric patients those seeking drugs or under the influence of drugs or alcohol 
are the most often responsible for assault, and these populations are likely to visit uh, this department. This facility, as proposed, would include a room for behavioral health patients as well as a pharmacy, increasing the likelihood that patients seeking drugs will, will visit. Um, and according to the survey, uh, many emergency physicians indicated that hospital reaction is often minimal to violence, um, sometimes limited to no action at all or merely escorting patients off the property, which in this case would be directly into the neighborhood. Um, certainly patients needing behavioral health treatment and pharmaceutical health treatment deserve and should have that care, um, but this isn't the place and putting it there jeopardizes the safety that we count on. Please deny this request. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Anyone else? Come on up. Good evening. Thanks uh, for the opportunity to speak tonight. I appreciate it and for all your hard work and service in uh, making Nashville a better place. Uh, my name is Chris Cobb. I live at 7751 Indian Springs Drive, which is uh, just less than a mile from the proposed location uh, inside the neighborhood that this site fronts. Um, I, I think... Um, we all support uh, care, right? We've heard that from everyone. There's there's no disagreement anywhere there. But um, what what I see here is a real quality of life concern uh, for the over 250 homes that are in the neighborhoods. That are every one of those homes is less than two miles from this site. <clears throat> um, 1.8 miles, the furthest home from this site, um, and. Uh, you should have received probably messages from, I think, 129 people in the neighborhood um, voicing their opposition uh, to this proposal. Uh, so it's over half who've emailed in uh, the people who live here um, that are going to be the most negatively impacted by this project uh, during construction, uh, post-construction, and when it's operational. And um, so I would just implore you to please consider uh, the people who live near the most near this site, um, as they're going to be the ones who are most negatively impacted uh, by this project. Specifically, um, and traffic has been addressed, and you know, a light is not allowed due to the proximity. We really need a light there. We need a light there now. It's already dangerous in and out of our neighborhood in the morning and in the afternoon, but a light is not allowed because of proximity to 40. Um, we additionally have a serious flooding issue, right? It, it's Bellevue, but this specifically um, is in multiple levels of floodplain. And currently, George E. Horn, uh, which is the street there that runs um, parallel, or perpendicular, rather, and 70 both flood. Um, they both flood regularly. And I just want to read an excerpt from a recent um, email. Uh, this was uh, correspondence to Stormwater in February 2022. Um, sent uh, March 23 of 2022. Councilmember Hauser implored so, the division to address the increasing so, flooding hazards. So your times ran out, yeah. and so you could potentially give that note to another uh, neighbor. Well, or, I think you all received a copy of this probably from Ms. Cormo, so you, you have it. We did. Thank, thank, thank you very you. much. I appreciate it. We really try to be lenient, but I, I appreciate it. We, just, we have homes flooding and roads flooding right there. Thank you. Thank you. All right, anyone else? Come on up. We want to make sure we get to everybody. Welcome. So my name's Elizabeth Rice. I live at 7908 Indian Springs Drive. Um, I have several strong objections, but given the length of time, I'm just going to focus on two and then uh, give a couple other thoughts. So you've heard mentioned already the traffic dish issue. We're all very concerned about this because that intersection of Georgie Horn, Harpeth Valley, and 70 is already a very challenging intersection for us to exit our um, subdivision in the mornings, at, in the evenings, at various times during the day. And we're going to add to that, as the gentleman before me mentioned, this high school traffic that we have no idea of that impact yet. And a month ago when we had a community meeting about this very project, we asked, you know, what, what do we know about what this high school uh, traffic is going to do? And nobody had an answer at that time. And unfortunately, though, I signed up for the email list like many other people did. I didn't receive an answer in my email either like I was told I was going to. Um, I, like everybody else, is concerned about sound pollution. I'm just 
trying to put you guys there. Imagine yourself sitting in your backyard at night trying to have a nice dinner with your family and what you're hearing are ambulance sirens because you're not far from an ER. Um, you know, there's a reason ERs are not planted in neighborhoods and that, that's a good part of it. Um, Though I'm not wearing my white coat, I too am a physician. Um, I am very well aware of how busy ERs are in the evening and night, and that's the time we're at our home trying to enjoy our time with our family and our, our uh, friends. Um, the last thing I just wanted to say was, you know, as everybody else has said, oh, one other thing about traffic, it's only going to increase as the uh, area further west on, on uh, 40 increases in size, right? We're going to have more growth out there. Traffic in our area is only going to increase, and traffic to the CR is only going to increase. So like everybody else, we welcome uh, TriStar to have a facility in Bellevue. It's just this is not the right property for it um, in the middle of somebody's neighborhood. So I ask you all to be brave, as somebody said earlier, and say no, um, and think of the pe people who are here uh, and their families will be negatively impacted. Thank, Thank you. you. Come on up. <clears throat> uh, Bruce Williams, uh, 130 Harpeth Valley Road in the neighborhood. Uh, would just like to say very much against it. Uh, all the statistics and policy that uh, people have been talking about, uh, but the biggest concern is, to me, uh, honestly, it, this is just the wrong location. Definitely want a hospital in Bellevue uh, or, or an emergency room, wrong location. Uh, Y'all have a lot of challenging decisions. If you go to the map, go across the street and get some gas and stand there for 30 seconds, it will be a very easy decision. This is not the right location. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? We'll make sure we get to everybody. Oh, one more. Be short. My name is Linda Nelson. I live at 7416 Hallows Drive. I've lived there since 1983. I've watched Bellevue grow a great deal. And I just want to pick up on a couple words that I've heard on the different proposals and even the last person saying, be brave. Be brave for you, your communities in Nashville. Ask TDOT and NDOT to work together to improve this city. Yes, at this parcel. Yes, in minimums and maximums in parking across the city. Be brave. We have a great city, but it depends on your planning. And it depends on you asking the developers to go the extra mile. They will make their money back. The residents will not. So keep that in mind and think ahead. Someone said a lot of these studies have been done on 2015 statistics. I heard someone said, that's like Nashville, BC. That's not just seven years ago. And this development and these parcels have largely exampled that. Thank you so much for all you do. Appreciate it. Thank you. Anyone else? Seeing no one else, rebuttal. Mr. White. Two minutes. Chairman, before I make my comments, I'd like to have this handed out, if you would, please. at the front, I'd like to ask for a show of hands of all the people that are here in support of this proposal. 
in consideration, uh, we've tried to be very careful with people that address the commission to express their concerns, but there's a significant number of people here that are supportive, as you evidenced by the show of hands. I also want to comment that the comments by former Council Lady Sherry Weiner, she lived in this neighborhood and still does, has been there 21 years, uh, period. She knows the neighborhood, knows the area. I also want to make the comment with respect to NDOT, there's a specific requirement by NDOT, which I will read in recommendation with respect to the traffic. A signal warrant analysis shall be conducted prior to the final SP approval, and a signal shall be constructed if and when directed by NDOT. Now, I'm going to comment at the front end. All the analysis so far, we're talking about traffic, it's decreased from the prior SP, by either 50 or 75 percent lesser traffic. That's not our numbers, that's Metro's numbers. With respect to the uh, issue of the impervious surface going from 51 to 37 percent, there's not a policy issue raised. But that's the issue. We kept talking about traffic and in listening to the comments, Almost to a person, they said, we really think this is a great idea for Bellevue, but not here. You're talking about the intersection of an interstate and Highway 70. And, and frankly, for people that have come to this mic and have said, we've had some issues, we'd like to have some concern, I really can't fathom that one person that would have come to this mic tonight, if they had an issue in their family that affected them the way that other people have articulated, wouldn't be a huge advocate for this. It's not in Bellevue, the closest place is St. Thomas West, it's a critical time. And so I urge everybody to understand, you don't pick emergencies. But when you do, this is a place that's incredibly well staffed, it's got the security. Uh, and in my opinion, if you look at the map that I just handed out, my client was willing to support the SP as the prior did, which had two ways in and out. We heard huge opposition from a number of neighbors saying, don't come down Harpeth Valley Drive. Thank so you, when Mr. NDOT Mayor. suggested that, we agreed to it. So we urge and respectfully ask for your approval. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. All right, Council Lady. Thank you. First, I want to appreciate the work that NDOT planning and TriStar has put into this and their responsiveness to the neighbors. Uh, this has been a process that not only is something that Bellevue needs, it's something this neighborhood needs. There are no losers. I am not asking anybody to sacrifice for the greater good. This is so much better for the neighborhood than the current zoning is. You've heard the numbers. There's 74 percent less traffic from this than what is already approved for this site. So if the neighbors are worried about noise, they would prefer having the TriStar Emergency Facility than the restaurant with live music that is already approved. I live over two blocks from Plantation uh, Pub that has live music. Between me and them is a row of trees, a creek, another row of trees, another half block, a row of buildings, another row of trees, and another half block. I hear their music for hours. The estimate is that there would be 2.2 ambulances coming to this site a day. So would you rather hear blip blip or hours and hours and hours of music? This is less noise than what is currently zoned. This is 74% less traffic. So I totally appreciate the neighbors being concerned about traffic. We all are. Nashville is, is traffic hell, basically, no matter where you are. And certainly having the high school down, down the road presents some more issues. That is one of the reasons that TriStar has worked with uh, NDOT, and we've actually moved the entrance place to the, the border of the property, so it's in line with, with 70's cut through that's already there. And so as the traffic studies show with the high school, this will be the perfect spot for a traffic light. That that would, traffic light would be synced with the light that's already at exit 196, so the traffic would still flow and it would be safe. We know that teenagers do crazy stuff. 
If you've got a teenager in that high school, wouldn't you like to know that within minutes they could be getting emergency care? Nash, uh, Bellevue has a large percentage of people that are, shall we say, not kicking young anymore. And the, all these 55 plus neighborhoods, the uh, assisted living places, the nursing homes, all this, they need emergency care. Now the neighbors have said they love the idea of having an emergency facility in, that, in Bellevue, but they don't necessarily want it this site. This is the perfect site for it because of the easy access. This is not a neighborhood that's in a, a, a rural, hidden area. It's surrounded on one side by I-40, on the other by 70, across the street from a Taiwan Do, a Mapco, a gun range, and a closed Shoney's. So we're not talking about going into a rural area. This is not a rural area. It's a very nice neighborhood. It's a lovely place, but it's not rural. This project is less impact on the neighborhood by every single thing that you can measure than what it's currently zoned for. So again, everybody wins by this project. Not only does Bellevue win and Nashville West win, but this specific neighborhood wins by this project. It is so much better than currently can be put on this site. And what currently can be put on this site is something they had agreed to in the past. This is so much better. And I urge you to look at that. I, I want to tell my, my neighbors that, that live in Bellevue Manor, this is really better for you. I totally believe that. NDOT believes it. Planning has believed it. And I urge you to please move this forward. Thank you. Thank you, Council Lady. Seeing no one else wish to speak, I declare the public hearing closed. Councilman, you want to go first? We haven't, I haven't started with you in a long time. So sure. Okay. Thank you. Um, I want to recognize uh, uh, former council member Sherry Weiner for coming out tonight, who uh, I had the pleasure of serving with during the last term. And um, I have always found uh, Sherry Weiner to be very responsive back when, before I was in, on council, when I was uh, a citizen in those same chairs, uh, I used to come to these meetings in council a lot. And uh, worked with the planning department on uh, passing a trio of infill housing bills back then. And Council Lady Wiener was very uh, thoughtful at that time and uh, has remained that way since. So I want to recognize her service, but also just speak to uh, the reputation that she has earned rightfully in the community for being very responsive to community concerns and very practical in finding solutions. So I, I find her participation in this uh, very, very helpful. I love working with Gloria Hauser uh, on the council as well. Uh, Councilmember Hauser um, really focuses a lot in our committees on services to the homeless and to people who need help. And I've really learned so much from Gloria Hauser, my colleague this term, and, and appreciate her care and for the community as a whole. So I think those two ladies bring a lot of credibility to this discussion, um, just as people, um, over and above the zoning piece that we have before us, but wanted to acknowledge that. Um, I mean, to me, this is a little bit of a no-brainer, I guess I would say. Um, I had heard from folks who were concerned about the location, as I often do, went out and took a look at the site. Uh, I do understand neighbor concerns that you might have cut through traffic into the neighborhood. It sounds like uh, everyone involved has worked with NDOT and TDOT, and one of the neighbors asked about that. But they have worked with NDOT and TDOT to remove that second entrance point off of the neighborhood street. Usually that's difficult to get NDOT to agree to, but uh, very persuasive community leaders were able to do that. So I, I think that really addresses the community concern about as, as well as we can ask from an NDOT standpoint. I did want to speak to uh, uh, the, the notion that the Bellevue community is apathetic. Um, the Bellevue community, um, I live on the opposite side of the county, but I know that they are very uh, engaged in their community. I know how engaged the Bellevue community was in bringing the high school construction to that site. Um, as I look at election results uh, from the general election, uh, just to give a, 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 some statistics a little bit behind the idea that Bellevue is somehow um, apathetic, it, uh, in round numbers in the district council races uh, for District 22, 
2022 and 2019, we had 3,200 votes. In District 23, we had about 4,500 votes. And in District 35, we had about 4,500 votes. That is at the upper end of voter participation in our district council races in Davidson County. So the evidence does not suggest to me that the, the Bellevue community is apathetic at all. And I think that the amount of uh, correspondence that we've seen on this shows, as well as the fact that so many folks would come and stay several hours at this hearing at a location that is uh, hard to get to. So I think that shows a lot of commitment, too, for this community, for, for people on both sides. I, I think it's fine to say that folks reach a different conclusion on this, but I, I don't see any evidence that there's any apathy in, in the Bellevue community, and I think that the... Um, the benefits of, of this plan at a location on a U.S. highway next to a uh, next to an interstate is is exactly the perfect location for it. In terms of the notion that folks would not want to live near a medical facility of any kind, the nearest analog I have for the East Nashville area is that we do have a TriStar Centennial Hospital, um, which is Skyline at Dickerson and Briley Parkway. They've been great neighbors. They take care of their site. They've worked very closely with Councilmember uh, Van Reese to add some retail stuff to the front, which is actually doing really well. They've added a hotel and a pizza shop and a few other things. That area, too, you will notice uh, if you go by Dickerson Road and Briley that we have lots and lots of housing being built over there. Lots of people want to live next to uh, a facility that provides medical care. Uh, as council members, we hear mostly from the community that people complain that they don't have adequate fire service or things of that nature, and it's hard to get another fire station for instance, and all of those kinds of medical care affect not only the quality of life in the neighborhoods, but also, frankly, their home value and insurance rates. So all of the, all of the factors that, uh, that this brings uh, aren't just an improvement over a zoning just in terms of car counts and impervious surface area, but I think that this is a real investment in the community that, that we hear people all over the county, especially in uh, wanting more of, is they want more services and they want more infrastructure, and this brings us at, a, at an appropriate location. Thank you, Councilman. Commissioner Johnson. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I echo the comment from my colleague and would like to thank our former uh, council member Wiener and the current uh, council member Hauser being in here and advocate for the community. And I would like to talk about uh, the policy uh, because uh, current policy is SP and comparing uh, existing uh, entitlement and comparing a uh, new proposal, I think it's uh, evident. It, it is much, much closer to existing policy, although uh, it's rather unusual for the commercial type of development to be in a T2 uh, area, but uh, because it is based on the old part. The old part allows commercial use, so therefore existing uh, SP. So traffic and uh, buffer and increase of uh, impervious, uh, decrease of impervious uh, surface, I think it's uh, quite evident uh, this new proposal is better suited for the uh, policy. And there was a lot of comment about traffic, but I think uh, based on the traffic study, uh, the memo uh, we received, uh, reduction of the traffic is uh, quite obvious. Uh, so I think uh, although, and also even though the traffic study suggests uh, reduction of uh, traffic, but one of the conditions is if indeed needed, uh, traffic light will be uh, required at that point. So I think it, all the bases are covered as far as traffic is concerned. But so the traffic issue was addressed. And as far as location, I think uh, considering uh, the existing usage across uh, from this location, uh, considering closest to the intersection, seems like uh, this proposed usage is a better use uh, compared to uh, current uh, base zoning. So uh, I understand a neighbor's sentiment, and I do 
sympathize occasional uh, noise uh, coming in the ambulance, but that's the nature of the business. I think benefit outweighs uh, those negative impact. And of course, you cannot avoid construction before and after, but afterwards, this uh, facility is being in here with great buffer, neighboring landscaping, and I think this will be much, much improved. I compared to current uh, condition. So for that uh, various reason, I am in support of staff recommendation. Thank you, Commissioner. Vice Chair. Um, I am uh, definitely leaning towards my fellow commissioners as well. Um, just to confirm, when a traffic study was done, would they have considered the impact of the high school coming in? I don't know about the timing of it. Sure, so they would have, um, typically when um, NDOT scopes a traffic study, um, they will scope out a certain area and they will want to include any background traffic from those and any uses that are that they know are coming, something like a high school. I don't have the traffic study in front of me. I can try to find it to see if that background data is all in there, but that is typically how it would be handled. Okay. Um, so I can see if I'm, if it's attached in our system, which it may be, to, tr to get you a precise answer. No, that's right. Okay, I just, I mean, I have to assume that, and especially um, I was uh, happy to see the condition in the, in the memo we just got that said that a um, signal study would be done. Um, so I assume by the time they, they conduct that analysis, they will also be thinking about the high school more um, at that point. Um, you know, this is obviously outside the purview of our decision making here, but um, I was I was interested uh, to to hear about the idea that emergency rooms um, increase access, or, you know, um, incidents with people using drugs, and that there's more likely to be people who are unhoused. Um, I know that's not what we consider, but is that something? I mean, given that was a theme in the comments, is that something that we did look into? Yes, um, we actually did um, have reach out to the Homeless Impact Division for some data from them. And Angie Hubbard, who's our Director of Housing, is actually here um, and can speak to that data that we received from the um, Homeless Impact Division. Come on up, Angie. Angie needs to come up since she's been here for four hours <laughs> <I know>. already. <laughs> Um, let me pull up my phone. Okay. I just went asleep with the data. So um, every year, um, MDHA and the Metro Homeless Impact Division do an annual point in time count, and they count unsheltered individuals in January because most it's cold, so most people are living uh, or in shelters. But in this year's point in time count and this um, trends um, with every year, most of the um, unsheltered population, they congregate in places where they have support among each other or support of the community in campsites. Um, near hospitals and emergency rooms was not one of the places where they found at, during the count. Um, we have neighborhood health that's near the rescue mission and room in the inn, and that's that's where um, persons that are um, unsheltered tend to um, congregate for services. And then I'll I'll just add that um, every emergency room department has the um, numbers of the MHIT outreach workers um, to do the coordinated entry. And if you're not familiar with that, that's the process of assessing an um, an unsheltered person for their um, health and mental health vulnerabilities and getting them prioritized on the list for services. And now with our $50 million, thank you all the council members in the room for that recent appropriation, um, moving to a housing first model where um, not only do we have money now to do the housing, but we have money for the uh, services that go around it and that case management to, um, to just completely wrap around that. So between those two, um, pieces of information is what we, we looked at that 
what what we're seeing in our city is is not a congregation around um, emergency rooms or hospitals and then um, if someone is discharged there is a pathway for them to get into case management through um, an MHID outreach worker and one of their partners I can't speak to the what happens on the inside I'll defer to one of the physicians maybe behind me on any of that but that's that's what we learned from from our uh, partners with the homeless impact division Thank you, Angie. Appreciate it. Um, you know, I, I, I recognize that uh, this is a big, a big change, um, but I am sort of with Councilman Withers that this just makes a lot of sense, the fact that it's right off 40. Um, obviously, TriStar is you know, they need to provide the best care they possibly can. They're not going to put um, an emergency care place in a, in, a, in a place that they don't think they can get people in quickly or that they're going to put people in danger. I just, you know, they've got their own reputation to uphold. So um, I do feel relatively confident that this they've considered all of these issues in selecting this site. Um, you know, and just thinking about high school, we have kids uh, at USN, which is it's almost directly across the street from the Vanderbilt emergency room. And um, no one will say trying to get up and down 21st is exactly convenient, but it seems like it's functioned pretty well in the middle of the um, university. I don't hear about too many issues. So hopefully that would not, you know, that would be okay in Bellevue as well. Okay, thank you, Vice Chair. Commissioner Hanley? So, well, a couple of things. I mean, I, I feel like a lot of the the comments that we heard um, when when folks were speaking in opposition have, have been addressed in, in the rebuttal and some of the comments from my fellow commissioners. I have a couple of questions that are out of curiosity. One, thanks for pr providing the document that shows um, just the one access point. That was that was going to be one of my questions, and now I, I see how that site is oriented. But uh, Lisa and Logan, one of the things we didn't, and, and if I, I missed it or I, we kind of breezed over it really quickly, but we didn't really address kind of the dynamic um, with Harpy Valley Place, which is somewhat of like a business enclave already. Um, I know that we, of course, had the council member speak to how the area, you know, is, she doesn't consider it rural. It does have a lot of activity on it. Um, but with that being said, I'm just curious about the um, direction that was done with the site plan, the orientation of the building. I can, of course, see the from the map and the, the delineation of the floodway, but it seems like one of the differences that um, this SP has um, in comparison to the previous one is it does pull the activated space further back, um, not significantly so, um, but, but I was just curious if there was a reason, maybe some guidance, influence that kind of shifted the structure further, further back, uh, other than what I'm seeing right here that seems somewhat obvious, which is the, the floodplain. Hi, uh, Commissioner Henley. To respond to that, when, when staff looked at the site plan here, I think one of the critical factors for you know looking at the streetscape is that Highway 70 is a scenic arterial boulevard, which intends to have landscaping to buffer the the road from the site, and that that designation in the major and collector street plan intends to give. Uh, those streets a certain character and that's really to have it buffered with landscaping so on those streets um, I think our orientation and building placement uh, you know lens that we look at the site at it is a little different so you know with the street classification here I, I think we were um, amenable to, to the site plan here with that building location yeah, that, I mean, that helps. I was, again, I was looking at the comparison of across Harper Valley Road, and it, it seemed as though they were more aligned with the structures being towards the, the street or the major arterial um, and the parking in the rear. And so just seeing it inverted, um, I had a question about it. Not, not necessarily opposed to it either way. Um, again, I mean, the measurables, I guess, is, is what I would say, seem to have kind of moved this SP in a direction that seem to make a lot of sense. I know it's always difficult to have, you know, new things go into any area and specifically to have 
Um, some things that some folks may consider as nuisances uh, are, are challenging, but I do feel it's an area that's extremely underserved for, for this type of, of, of need. And I feel like the thing about our city is everything has to go somewhere. We've got to figure out how to put the things we need somewhere. This seems like a very well thought out plan. It actually is going in a location that already had an SP that was going to be a very active site. And so it seems like um, for the for the zoning and the activity it was already zoned for, it's not creating um, a, a more harmful um, transition. So with, with that in mind, I'm, I'm more inclined to support it. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Clifton. Well, I, um, I actually live close to a hospital, um, probably about as close as, as, as this, uh, these houses are. Uh, and I hear a lot of ambulances and uh, helicopters going overhead. And what I hear is uh, people's lives being saved. I don't mean that to cut anybody down for wanting to make sure this goes in the right place, but that's what I hear. Um, and that's what happens there. So. I am, now that I think about it, really surprised that we have not had any such facility. Um, we have them other, other parts of the county that are not close to Vanderbilt University, where I live, close to. But we, it's a long way from, from an emergency room out there. I, I, I see this just, just a, a tremendous step forward. I, um, I, I, I'm familiar with this stretch. I, I, I uh, go to the JCC several times a month taking someone to work out that way. Um, I cannot imagine a better place in all of Bellevue than, than on this this highway close to this interstate exit. Uh, so I'm, I do not minimize the concerns over something that is very new and that they do, that people just don't know what will happen, but I think it is an inspired place for this. Thank you. So, Commissioner Clifton, it's time for a motion. Well, I, You're the sure. last speaker. Oh, well, it, <laughs> I don't know what my track record is. Oh, yeah, okay. But I would move we approve uh, staff recommendation. That's a proper motion. And second, any other discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Ayes have it. All right. Item 20 is approved. And we do appreciate everybody coming down. Um, I know it's a, it was a long wait, but, but thank you very much. We really do appreciate it. We'll let everybody kind of, if everybody could do us a favor, though, is if, if, if everybody could, could exit quickly, because we're still in the middle of our meeting, we would really appreciate it. <laughs> We'll just give them a few minutes. I got my COVID and my flu shot. Oh. It's like, it feels like it's I got my flu shot a couple days ago. And I had a, I had a little bit of it. You got it in the same room? Well, I said, well, do it in the other one. They were like, oh, no, no, no. It'll, then you'll be sore. But. All right, commissioners, we're, well, hold on one second, wait one second, let's, so as, as we move through the night, commissioners, we're on item 21, uh, this item was, um, it's, it's the Primrose Neighborhood UDO, uh, by, and I want to see, is there anyone in here that's in opposition? Okay, well, we'll hear the case, thank you for coming. You've waited a long time. Yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Jared Isliss with the Planning Commission, um, and I'm here to present item 21, a request to amend the existing Primrose Neighborhood UDO. The Primrose Neighborhood UDO was established in 2011 to institute design standards that would preserve the unique identity of the Primrose Neighborhood and ensure that new homes and additions to homes match this unique identity. This request is to amend the UDO by replacing the existing document with an updated document to clarify various neighborhood defining characteristics, including maintaining the scale and proportionality of the existing homes within the neighborhood. Since 2011, many existing homes have been renovated and expanded upon as new homes have also been built. 
Also during this time, planning has added new staff and we want to be sure that the regulations are being interpreted and enforced with the original intent. The underlying zoning within the UDO area is single family residential or R8, which is intended for medium intensity, one family and two family development. The existing policy is T4 urban neighborhood maintenance, which is intended to maintain urban neighborhoods as characterized by their moderate to high density residential development pattern. After filing the UDO amendment with the uh, Planning Commission and the Council, the bill passed the first reading at Council on uh, November or September 20th. Earlier this month, Metro Planning staff, Council Member Cash, and members of the Primrose neighborhood met to discuss the proposed UDO amendment. Attendees voiced their support behind the intent of the amendment and gave valuable feedback on the initial draft, including on a proposed standard intended to further require dormers be subordinate to other roof structures, which is a key characteristic in the existing neighborhood. Um, a couple days later, a revised draft as well as a corresponding amendment to the council bill was published, which implemented much of the feedback from the community conversation, including an update to that uh, proposal for, with the dormer clearance, um, reducing the impacts of that standard on future homes and um, additions, which addressed the community's concern with that standard. Um, following tonight's public hearing at the Planning Commission, there will be a public hearing at Council uh, on November 1st. So the final draft, which is the draft that came out after the community meeting um, of the proposed UDO amendment seeks to clarify uh, those neighborhood defining characteristics by updating, adding a couple standards. Um, the table in the staff report kind of goes through those one by one but I'm gonna kind of summarize those here which the actual page from the UDO document. Um, so first, bulk standard B was reworded to read as eave height for main and secondary roof structures. Um, and that was to better describe the intent behind the standard. There's a corresponding diagram on the right hand side of the page which was also updated and expanded upon to reflect that update to the language of um, bulk standard B. Um, we also moved what was a footnote on the um, bulk standards table up to the top of the um, table to be included within the standard. Um, and we also reworded that footnote to read as eave height is required to be met for the entire length of the front facade except for dormers. And so if you look on the right hand side of the page with those diagrams, you'll see a red dashed line. That is that eave line height that we are um, saying needs to be met for the entire length of the front facade. The second main component of the amendment is an, uh, a new standard, which is bulk standard D. This was the, um, the standard that was discussed at the community meeting and updated after that community meeting. Um, it was added to require a minimum of 18 inches clearance from the dormer to the sidewall. This standard has been added to further require that dormers be subordinate to other roof structures. So you can kind of see that uh, in the diagram, the far right diagram. Um, and as I mentioned, that was the standard that we discussed on the previous slide. Lastly, a side profile of the diagram and various definitions of the terms were added. So in the, in the current um, uh, UDO document, the side profile of the diagram is not in there. It's just the front facing diagram. So we thought adding the second this uh, side diagram would kind of help clarify some of these standards. Um, and then the definitions were added to kind of relate back to the bulk standards table and some of the terms that we're using. So that's very clear between the table, the diagrams, and the definition for everyone who reviews the UDO document. Um, and with that, we recommend that the amendment, um, sorry, <laughs> staff recommends approval with amendment to replace the updated document as well as the uh, filed council bill. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. We appreciate it. And so, commissioners, we'll open this item for public hearing. Uh, we are the applicant, and so we just presented. And so we'll go through our process. Anyone wishing to speak in support? 
seeing none, anyone wishing to speak in opposition, come on up. Welcome. And as a reminder, just please state your name and address. Thank you. I was going to say this is my first rodeo. So um, my name is Erin Carb. I'm at 2916 Primrose Circle. Um, the reason that this is ultimately being brought in front of you right now is because there are two properties that were built a couple doors down from us that are in um, blatant violation of the current overlay. Um, the plans were erroneously approved. Um, they should have never been approved to begin with, um, despite neighbors and myself calling attention to their non-compliance. Um, I, I ultimately don't believe that the issue at hand here is the UDO needing clarity. The, the existing UDO is pretty clear. Um, the, the eve height is the primary issue here, and um, the, that's the primary issue that the properties in question violated. Um, there's no stretch of the imagination in which what was built um, could be considered compliant with what is existing. Um, it was a mistake, and that was admitted when the UNO was revoked afterwards because the properties are non-compliant. Um, so in regards to Eve Height, this is basically just a Band-Aid. It's adding words that essentially are saying the same thing. Um, it's ultimately just going to restrict the, the addition of the dormer um, restrictions is just going to restrict existing homeowners from being able to renovate and is going to ultimately incentivize people to tear down the properties and just rebuild, which is what ended up happening a couple houses down. Um, my understanding at this point is that a warrant's been issued to begin the legal process to compel the builders to come back and respond to some um, requests from planning and from codes to bring it up to compliance or to um, acknowledge their non-compliance and figure out resolution. Um, and ultimately what I'm concerned concerned about is that amending the overlay is going to hurt our ability to um, resolve the issue because the builders are going to come back and point and say, see, it was unclear. Um, so anyway, I, I don't think it's an issue of clarity. I think it's an issue of enforcement. Thank you. Appreciate it. Anyone else wishing to speak? Opposition? The council member already spoke, and so seeing no one else wishing to speak, I declare the public hearing closed. Vice Chair, do you want to go first? Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's been a long night. I can't remember what the council person said. Does anybody have a record? <laughs> he was supportive of it. Um, so I think I think that the. Um, the commenter's points are interesting. Um, uh, so how how would the dormer, I guess I'm trying to figure out how the dormer issue, how that will impact other homeowners, like what the issue will be with the dormers that would impact the homeowner's ability to renovate? If I could ask uh, the team to come up and um, address the question. I mean, obviously, we put a, a standard here to protect the character of this area, so we don't want buildings to be torn down. That's obviously not our intent. Um, I do think that having more visual tools to explain what it is that we are looking for is, is actually helpful. We've seen that in other, in other UDOs and tools that we have, but I, we certainly don't want to disincentivize renovations and things. So what are your, what's, what's your thought, or Joni, either, whoever um, wants to address the question. Um, thank you for asking. So um, this UDO was put in place um, over 10 years ago, and it was, I believe, an effort to um, provide guidance uh, for infill, for new construction, for renovation that wasn't quite as restrictive or heavy-handed as a historic overlay might be um, and did allow for some reuse and maybe expansion beyond what a historic overlay would allow. And so the, the and there was an intent that these, these are single family homes. This is not, um, you know, these are not big builders coming in and doing this work. And so the intent of the document was to be very straightforward, very streamlined, very simple to understand. And over time, we have seen um, builders become a little more aggressive with their interpretation of those standards. Um, 
And it became clear to us that there is a gray zone on, particularly on how dormers meet uh, and are subservient to the primary roof line. And so we believe it warrants a clarification, particularly on new construction. Um, but I don't think that there's a scenario where um, the regulations we're proposing for dormers would be prohibitive on an existing structure, right? The regulations are you have to be inset from the primary walls so that you look and are, are truly subservient to that main roof line. There is always in UDOs a modification process um, where somebody, if they weren't meeting that strict standard, could come to this board for review. Um, and I, I think that could be appropriate just depending on the proposal at hand. Um, but I think that the issue that we have found that needed clarification was how a dormer sits within a roof line rather than being flush with any main part of that facade. Okay, so this was really trying to clarify what the intent originally was 10 years ago. Correct. Um, and even some of the photo examples that were given in the original document, we kind of teased those out and went back and dissected what they intended to display to help us craft those regulations. Certainly looking at the visuals, what's proposed makes a lot of sense. So I am um, inclined to support staff's recommendation. <clears throat> Thank you, Commissioner Blackshear. That was really helpful, your explanation. Um, I also think that the neighbor's comments were really interesting. Um, anytime you want to clarify something, it, it obviously um, means that whatever you had done before can be improved. And just because it can be improved doesn't mean that it was, and this goes to your point about the the person who's not in compliance arguing that um, it was unclear. It sounds like, I mean, you're very convincing. It sounds like from what you're saying that it was clear that what they did was not compliant, but that doesn't mean that what the UDO currently has in its document could not be improved. And it sounds like there's always room for improvement as it relates to this um, document and obviously the photos. Um, they look good. I'm assuming they're better than what was in the UDO document before that. So I would be in favor of the uh, of the amendment, and I certainly hope that um, I'm not picking size, but from what you're saying, I, I hope that this does not negatively impact the ability of that to be resolved successfully. Well, before I go to the commissioner, I, I guess in my mind real quick, because we're on this, is maybe a interpretation from our attorney, would this affect those legal proceedings in any way, shape, or form to reduce, I mean, would it, it would affect those legal proceedings, I guess? I'd, I'd say, first of all, the the property owners in question um, that the member of the public brought up, they have vested rights in, in the existing uh, UDO. I'll also say that um, our office is aware of this, and we're reviewing this ourselves just to, to see what what kind of action that would be relevant to that. But correcting any um, any document like this, or not correcting, but trying to make it more clear, you know, that's not something that's going to negatively impact a legal case. You know, this is a subsequent remedial measure. This is something that um, we're always trying to make our documents and our um, and our, our actions more clear. And we don't think that's going to have a negative impact on any legal action we would pursue in that case. Thank you. Commissioner Johnson. Sorry to interrupt. Sure. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you for the comment. And I do understand oftentimes it's, uh, you know, rather implementation problem than following the regulation. But I uh, echo our fellow commissioners uh, because if current document has certain ambiguity or certain portion is not clear enough, I think it's always good to... Uh, precisely uh, clarify the document. And I am uncomfortable this DOMA was determined by result of the community meeting. And so now it makes more uh, clear uh, guideline. And as I'm sitting in the historic zoning commission, I see all this uh, clarification and also comes with um, 
expansion and those requests. But those people who live in this certain neighborhood, they pride their neighborhood. So they always try to uh, follow the guideline. And of course, sometimes, you know, there's always some people try to push the envelope. But, you know, as long as we do have a clear guideline, uh, we can always accommodate. And so there's uh, typically no teardown unless uh, it is intentional. So, but by clarifying this language, I think we are encouraging negative impact, uh, rather more uh, preservation of the wonderful uh, neighborhood. So I'm in support of the staff uh, recommendation. Councilman. Uh, thank you, Chair. Could I, I know it is late, uh, could I seek clarification on a, a point? So uh, the neighbor who spoke referenced, I think, two properties that, uh, as she described it, were clearly not meeting the guidelines. So were those permits reviewed by our staff and approved as that way, or did someone build, just build differently than what the permit said? I'm happy to clarify that, and I'll, I'll trust Alex to um, tell me when I, I overstep my discussion here. Um, so they, uh, the builder filed um, final site plan with our staff. Those drawings were reviewed. Um, it was brought to our attention that what was being built was not in, compliant with the drawings that had been submitted, and so we reviewed that. And that was the case. We asked the applicant, or we asked the builder for updated drawings. Those drawings were submitted to us, and then um, it was determined at that point that the the drawings, the new drawings, and what was being built were compliant with the regulations. And that was the gray zone. So um, they they kind of did w a little bit of a turn. It was um, not a significant turn, um, not a substantial difference, but it was a difference, which matters, right? You need to build what you filed. Um, and so when we reviewed that updated set, we found it to be compliant, but acknowledged that there was this gray zone that probably warranted further clarification. Following several um, discussions back and forth with the code administrator and others, um, uh, um, the zoning administrator determined that it was not compliant, and so the use and occupancy permits were revoked. And so that's the position that we're in now, is that they, um, the builder may choose to file an item A appeal with the Board of Zoning Appeals to um, uh, um, appeal the decision made by the zoning administrator saying that they are non-compliant. So uh, that's tangled, I know. I uh, hope you can follow those steps. But um, that's that's where we're, where we're sitting right now, where they are in a position where they have been determined to be non-compliant and have to uh, kind of make a choice to either um, come into compliance or to seek that item A appeal. Well, thank you. That, that's really helpful because sometimes I know with with our conservation overlays, we see that people sometimes have a little bit of room uh, to, uh, especially with like foundation heights and some of those things. But sometimes people get plans that are approved and then do something totally different. I've had people pull a permit for a deck and then it's a, it's uh, an outbuilding or a room, which was not a deck. So, you know, sometimes, but th those are real things that happen. I know recently on the Historic Zoning Commission, you've had quite a few uh, cases for violations for people just did something different than what was permitted. But so that, that's really helpful for that and getting that context. So it, it sounds as though um, clarity is helpful to everyone. So uh, based on that, I, I, just, I definitely understand the neighbor's concern and feel as though uh, this is an appropriate step. To, one other question, though, maybe um, since the council member isn't here, uh, could you talk a little bit about, uh, it sounds like there was a community meeting, and was that well attended, or just kind of what was that? Fee? I know this isn't a huge area to begin with, but what was the particip participation like at that community? Ma'am, ma'am, no, the answer is no. Um, uh, I think that I appreciate you uh, being here. Um, and so if you have another, if you, if you have another issue, potentially there's another remedy, but unfortunately it's not right here at this time. Okay. Thank you. Go ahead. Yeah, um, so we did have a community meeting. It was over Zoom. 
I'd say there was maybe six-ish people in attendance in addition um, to myself and the council member. Um, what we typically do is just kind of walk them through what the current amendment was. And so that was the first draft that I had talked about, uh, which is not the draft that you see here. Um, I walked them through what we were proposing to change, what was changed from the current amendment or the current UDO. Um, and then there was discussions about some of the things that you've heard tonight um, and some of the things we've obviously implemented since that community meeting that I discussed during the presentation. Um, but overall, I, it was, it was I, I felt like as if the uh, attendees in the room were supportive of the intent behind the UDO, which was to clarify the existing UDO through the amendment. Okay, well, well thankful, that's, thank, that, that's helpful. And, you know, as Commissioner, for, or Commissioner Johnson knows, you know, we uh, went through a process of sort of updating our conservation overlay guidelines too, and that, that went on for a long time, but that's a whole lot of properties. So, uh, but I appreciate that information about the participation. So based on those things, uh, I, I will support the staff recommendation and look forward to any further discussion with Council Member Cash about any final tweaks. Thank you, Council. Commissioner Clifton. I guess I was, I'm somewhat familiar with this because it's in an adjoining neighborhood just as a citizen. But um, there was a concern raised that it, this could somehow lead to um, a p potential uh, destruction of the home, that tear down because of the, the process. Um, I guess it's a legal question. Is that, is that the way you heard it as a potential issue to think, clarify? I think our our um, our litigation team is just starting to look at this, so they're they're looking through remedies and figuring out how to to look at that. So at this point, I don't know what our remedies would be. Wait, can I clarify? I think. Sorry, I think I heard a concern that this would discourage other yeah. folks on the street mm -hmm. from renovating existing houses and, and and because they couldn't renovate to meet these standards then they might just tear their house down is that that's what I is that yes okay well that leads me that, that's probably what, what okay so I don't think that's in the litigation space that's in the it, unintended it's a practical effects play, mm -hmm. place um, so the question then becomes, um, do if something okay because right now in a conservation overlay district, if if something is allowed to become derelict, at some point, the city can demolish it. That that happens. So that that's the concern these folks have. Um, Unless I'm wrong, because it's about to happen on my street. <laughs> I mean, no one can find the person. It's, it's not decayed, and even though it's a beautiful old home, it's going to be torn down. Well, and hold on, Commissioner Clifton. So, can somebody answer that when we do demolish over a certain? Re is that? I don't think that it leads to. That. So perhaps I guess the what. What we're proposing is a clarification, a visual clarification of an existing standard, which I presume has generally been working well with the exception of the two homes. And so would a clarifying language around dormers um, and how they meet the other architectural elements that were laid out in the staff report, would that um, result in folks tearing down their homes. Uh, Joni, did you want to answer or address any part of that question? This is really, this isn't a new regulation. This is just meant to visually clarify something that's been in place for about 10 oh, I, I know. years, right? So I just was interested in whether there was. Sure. So. Um, the regulation that exists today is about the primary presence of the primary roof line, and um, and there's uh, the eave height. Their height is measured in a couple of different ways. The proposal is not changing any of those numbers. It's not changing any of those standards, but it does further clarify the relationship of a dormer to that main roof line so that a dormer can't be so expansive that it is um, 
um, negating the original intent of of all of the structures appearing to be a story and a half maximum, so that you're not building a full two-story building, uh, a full two-story house, but you're building a one and a half story house. So that's the intent is to just clarify that relationship of dormers to the okay. evening. And Joni, if mm-hmm. the homes were demolished, yes, if they were demolished, if any home was demolished and rebuilt, would they need to meet the standard? Yes. So all new construction and all renovations, um, expansions, anything related to existing housing. And I would say, um, Commissioner, in this neighborhood, I don't know the exact numbers, but it's a pretty fair balance of renovations and new construction. It is not primarily one or the other, which was an intent of uh, the original UDO when it was put in place, was to support and direct and guide renovations um, and allow people to use their existing homes and update them, um, but keep that compatibility and then provide opportunity for new construction also. Thank you. I think it's Commissioner Hanley. I remember somebody saying this was going to be quick. Um, I, I will say my main question um, after hearing the, the comments um, was related to the the current legal standing and, and how this may impact that. Um, understanding that, I feel pretty comfortable. I understand the intent of what's being done here and, and adding clarification. And that was my really my only concern. So we are ready for a motion, Commissioner Henley. Yeah. Come or, oh, 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 wait. I'm sorry. Um, no, just, more discussion. Just Vice in case, chair? just in case the commenter doesn't like have the full picture in front of her of the process. Can we just say, like, okay, so we take a vote tonight. Where does it go from here? Because she would have another chance to... You're good with that? Okay. Then then go with your motion. It goes to council. <laughs> goes to council. Yeah. So you'll have another another chance. <laughs> All right, Commissioner Hanley, you want to make a motion? Uh, yes, I move to approve um, staff's recommendation, um, which is an approval with an amendment. And so that is... A proper motion on item 21 and a second. Any other discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Those no, ayes have it. And item 21 is adopted. Now we're on to item 23. And so item 23 was on the consent, but there is opposition. So we're on item 23 for the public hearing. Jason, we're ready for you. Hey, this is item 23. It's a request to apply at a contextual overlay district. Parcels impacted are outlined in red. I didn't count these, but it's approximately 207 acres. The homes in the area are mostly single story and split level ranch. There's a predominantly a predominant development pattern in the neighborhood. It has large lots, with consistent bulk standards and massing present throughout the proposed overlay with a few exceptions. Staff is recommending approval. The zoning on the subject site or the area is single family residential. This application of the proposed overlay will not change the zoning and provides additional standards to what is required under the existing zoning. The policy of suburban neighborhood maintenance generally is intended to maintain the character of the suburban area it is applied. There, there's also some conservation area in, in, this, in this area and is intended to protect the hillsides and streams within the subject area. And again, the proposed overlay does not permit any development that's not permitted by the base single family zoning district and only adds additional design standards. This slide highlights some of the standards of the overlay. It provides additional standards pertaining to setbacks, height, building coverage, access, garages, and parking. Typically, these look at, um, compares the new development to the houses on both sides of the site. And we're looking at setbacks and height. Um, no greater than, height can be no greater than 35 feet or 125% of the structures of two lots abutting each side. Also pertains to coverage for garages and parking. It requires access to alleys when they're present. There aren't any alleys in this area, so they would be from drives, 
quarter lots access to be within 30 feet from the rear property line. You can only have one driveway per street frontage. Driveways in exceed 12 foot in width and front detached garages are behind or rear of primary structures, which is consistent with the overall area. In conclusion, staff is recommending approval. Given the overall consistent character of the area, the proposed contextual overlay district will help to ensure the existing character is maintained, which is consistent with the neighborhood maintenance policy that applies to the area. Thank you, sir. And we'll open this item, commissioners, we'll open this item for public hearing. And the, the councilman is not here. He spoke earlier. He's really the applicant for the area. And so we'll go through our speakers. Anyone in the room wishing to speak in support? Seeing none, anyone wishing to speak in opposition? Come on up. Welcome and thank you for waiting for for almost five hours. <laughs> well, th thank you for listening. My name's Tom Gus. I live at 2910 Knobdale, which is in the subdivision. Um, this, I'll just kind of go over it real quick. The, um, we had three meetings. What happened was a guy built a, basically an aircraft tower in his backyard attached to a house. It's three stories tall and it's, <laughs> you know, it looks just like an aircraft tower. And that scared some of the neighbors, especially the people that live up on the hill that can see the fireworks on 4th of July. So they rushed to judgment on um, putting this, to try to do something. And uh, Councilman Syracuse has been very helpful. I commend him. He's done a great job. He's actually found, uh, I think he's found, he, as he stated, he's going to withdraw this later. So I might be just speaking for no reason, but um, he he's found a solution that's good for everybody. Um, my um, opposition is based on when I bought this property, I spent three years trying to find a non-HOA um, piece of property that, um, and I did hundreds of of sales contracts that never came through, but I finally got this one. And um, what I one of my primary reasons was I wanted to have a place. My parents are getting elderly. I wanted to have a place where I could make a little expansion and let them live with me for some time and have them have their own light den. And they didn't. Um, and with this overlay, that would I wouldn't be able to do that because the the way the overlay is. Uh, Lincoya Hills is a lovely neighborhood. It's um, rectangular ranch houses with seven windows on the front, mostly, and little porches. It's it's not historic. It's not, you know, but it's a nice neighborhood. But it has great big lots, and that's what the people like. There's a lot of families coming in, and they want to expand, too. So um, Jeff said it was 60-40 against when he got all of once he put the signs out. So anyway, I'm just opposed. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, anyone else? Seeing no one else wishing to speak, I declare the public hearing closed. And Commissioner Blackshear, you want to go first? And I have made eye contact with you, Chairman. You don't make eye contact. <laughs> um, we did hear from the councilman on this, and the neighbor is right that he indicated that he was going to kill it, but he wanted this to be approved so that um, it could be considered pending legislation. So if our council could just explain what the councilman was talking about that and the effects. Yeah, so um, it becomes pending legislation in theory once it's first reading at council and then heard at planning. So the idea is that once you all make a recommendation, it then sets that protection in place with the idea that the council member will then introduce another bill later and have that become pending. It kind of holds the, it holds the protections, then removes this one. So um, I think that's what he's attempting to do, and I think that's the legal effect of what he's doing. And so we would see whatever new bill would come up from the councilman, correct? Yes. And I think Lisa may be able okay. to speak to that. So um, council member Syracuse has filed, or it will be filed, I believe, on Tuesday, um, a new overlay. Just really, can you see it turn off other people, maybe? A, a new overlay that um, would be a, so we have heard from some of our larger um, lot suburban subdivisions that the contextual overlay 
provides the height protections that they are looking for, but is maybe too restrictive in regards to the coverage, the lot coverage or the ability to add on to what are primarily sort of low slung ranch houses. And so council member Syracuse has been trying to, um, and we often get requests like, can we tweak the contextual overlay to fit our neighborhood? And that's just sort of not how the contextual overlay works. It comes up with a set of standards and those standards are applied to the neighborhood. The effect is different based on whatever the neighborhood is because they are contextual to the properties. And so council member Syracuse um, has, is proposing an overlay that would essentially be able to be placed on a neighborhood that would limit any um, anything to two stories. So where all base zoning districts allow three stories, um, it would essentially be like the contextual overlay, except it would only be looking at height. Um, that is being filed and proposed. We have not yet reviewed that. We've not made a recommendation. Um, but that is under review, and I believe we asked him because we had a whole lot of things. I think he's going to defer the public hearing after it's introduced to January to allow us time to analyze it. So, but that would be what, and then he would, in theory, create that overlay and then apply it. So that was very helpful. I forgot that he had talked about the three stories. Um, so it sounds like the councilman is going to address your particular concern. So our question tonight is whether we approve it so that there is pending legislation so another aircraft tower cannot be built in the interim, or whether we... Um, disapprove it and say, hey, we'll just see the bill when it comes back towards us. Is that right? Isn't that still pending? Like so a, dis a disapproval still actually makes it pending oh, really? because it's just, okay. it's just the trigger of a planning commission recommendation. If I can say, I, I, well, I kind of walked through the machinations, but I'd recommend just making the decision based on the merits of the proposal alone without considering the, the pending ordinance issue. <laughs> Okay. Well, it sounds like it doesn't have any effect either way on whether it's pending legislation. So I would not make that decision based on that. I'm just saying, effectively, there's no difference. Um, well, I mean, I think the neighbor's concerns are valid, and so I would not, I would not approve this um, in the absence of knowing whatever's coming before us. I mean, I think that this would not be... Um, the best way to handle the concerns. Effectively, I think it still is pending legislation, so whatever concerns the councilman would have, it would still be addressed. So um, I guess I would be, I didn't think I would come out this way, but I guess I'd be in favor of not approving the bill. Thank you, Chair. Um, it is a very uh, interesting proposal. Uh, I think I totally understand nobody want to see aircraft tower in the middle of a ranch uh, residential zoning. So it seems like uh, this bill is a stopgap measure in that sense. Um, so. I would be in support if all of the neighbors are in towards that uh, direction. But like uh, you know, Commissioner Blackshear, I, I see unintended consequences in between. Um, if we put a contextual overlay uh, in the meantime, uh, it will prevent somebody to do what they intend to do. So if uh, Councilman Silicus is bringing in great uh, bill, I think uh, that will be uh, right direction. So uh, I'm concerned uh, unintended cons uh, consequences in between. So. Uh, ironically, I am um, agreeing in uh, Commissioner Blackshear. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Uh, th this is an uh, interesting case, and um, 
you know, again, I was working with planning staff. Uh, some of our East Nashville neighborhoods that were ranch, that are uh, ranch neighborhoods uh, a few years ago uh, did not have any protection that was available to them unless you qualified for a conservation overlay. And that was a lot of the part of the reason why the contextual overlay was created was that it uh, would help to uh, allow growth to happen, but still kind of maintain the scale specifically of suburban neighborhoods with a lower, generally a lower height, and especially to preserve open space, which is a lot of what the lot coverage provision does. It's not that it's a design guideline, it preserves open space. Um, and I've had conversations with Councilmember Syracuse about this. Um, uh, one of the first areas uh, in East Nashville to uh, adopt the uh, contextual overlay was part of our tornado impact area in 2020, right? Now we have two family zoning in that area. And what I've observed and what I share with folks is that even the most homes are the 60s ranch homes that are, you know, maybe 1,500 square feet or something like that. They're usually um, single story. Some of those in that community have a, a lot that slopes in the rear. So sometimes they have a walkout basement. Um, but even in those neighborhoods with those restrictions, not only are people... I can only think of a few cases where people had limitations on their additions to their houses that they were seeking. And in many cases, um, even with a lot coverage requirement or a maximum, folks have been able to build two houses on the two-family lots, and they've been able to build one-and-a-half-story homes that uh, tend to blend into the neighborhood well. So that's kind of is my skepticism about this a little bit. I mean, I know definitely in the, those mathematical numbers cut different ways depending on how large of a foundation area the houses are that are around you. Um, but if in many of those ranch neighborhoods, uh, kind of by the Shelby Park or Shelby Bottoms area, you can not only do additions to a house, you can build two on the lot within the contextual overlay guidelines. And so, you know, for me, that's a little bit of my skepticism uh, is that um, it, it, if the... Uh, if the concern is that you have a few homeowners that it doesn't work out for, they don't have lot considerations that would work for an item A appeal, you know, it sort of at some point becomes uh, a judgment call of the council member about whether the majority of people want it or not. Um, and it sounds like, in this case, the majority have made the determination that they do not want the contextual overlay. And so, which is fine. I mean, it's their property, it's their neighborhood. So that, that's what gives me a little bit of pause, if that's true, about recommending approval of something in the interim. Also, I've shared with Council Member Syracuse that um, when planning staff uh, were working on crafting the contextual overlay, at that time, uh, we were having a lot of infill housing, and the builder community kind of thought that we were going to stop all development in town, and we had a lot of opposition to it. Um, and we workshopped it with neighborhood groups. Um, but the... Um, uh, but what I was going to say is that the uh, the contextual overlay was adopted, um, and we have, have had a lot of growth. But you can still, if you are creating a new overlay, you could still have a lot of feedback that you get that um, that may be really constructive feedback, or there could be issues, you know what I mean, that you would want to consider. And so it's difficult to say that... Um, that this new overlay tool would be uh, finished and approved as enabling legislation within a certain period of time. And so I think that I, I definitely appreciate the goal of that, but just worry about what that process would be like and, and the speculation of putting in a contextual overlay that appears to be unpopular with the uh, homeowners while waiting for something else. So I'm a little bit torn on it, but just wanted to expand on, on that a little bit, just because I've seen it. I've seen overlay proposals that sound good, take a little while to get ready. So, I mean, I think from, from my understanding, I think it was, I had the exact same question I think that, that Commissioner Blackshear had. I think I, I think I have clarity on that now. I mean, my interpretation of it, it seems it's just more restrictive than the, the needs uh, and desires of the community. Um, but I do understand this has been something that was brought to, to our staff by the, by the council member um, and trusted that it'll be, it'll be stewarded appropriately going forward. But... 
we didn't have a lot of people in favor for it, and it sounds like, honestly, once people saw exactly what it was, they actually didn't didn't care for it. So, I mean, to me, that kind of leads me to, to my answer. It's a it's a contextual overlay that should be guided by what the community's desires are. So, like, the community's desires are majority to not take this action, but I do understand the procedural approach that we're taking here. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable with what we've discussed here today. Commissioner Glenn. I would move that we disapprove for all Proper the reasons given. Hold on. Click it here, your motion. Vice Chair. I just moved disapproval. Uh, oh, Commissioner Clifford, the Vice Chair, I have negated to call on her, and I went out of order. So <laughs> Not that I have anything. Hold your motion one second. Vice Chair. Um, I think oh, we don't push that. My only comment would be whenever we have something of that scale, I think you would expect to see a person here in support of it. And one person in opposition with, some, with that many properties to me says... So, and if it makes no difference from a pending legislation perspective, if it's approved or disapproved, it's still pending legislation, uh, I would vote to disapprove because um, that seems to be what's the right decision for this property. So, Commissioner but Clifton, it's time for a motion. You can make the motion and I'll second it. <laughs> Commissioner Clifton moves to disapprove. It's a proper motion. Disapproval. Second by the vice chair. Any other discussion? Seeing none, all in disapproval say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Ayes have it. All right. So, that was item 23. We're going to hold on one second. We're, we're, we're running low on quorum here. Chair is detecting difficulties in quorum. Give us one second. Text a quorum still. Is there someone here for 28? Is there someone here for 28? Uh, that's a no, that's a disapproval. She got married last week. All right, everybody. Let's, we, um, we've heard a rumor <laughs> that you've been married. I was married over the weekend. Over the weekend. Yeah. Uh, let's give her a little applause. Way to go, man. Congratulations. Thank you. It was strategically between planning commission weeks. Of course. It was. <laughs> it shows a lot of commitment. So thank you. All right, Amelia. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, my name is Amelia Lewis, and I will be presenting item 28 tonight. Um, the request is to rezone from R8 to CL. Staff's recommendation is to disapprove. Um, the site is about 0.62 acres on the west side of Old Buena Vista, north of the intersection of Old Buena Vista Road and West Trinity Lane. Uh, the properties to the north are zoned single-family residential, um, to the west are zoned mixed-use limited, and to the south the properties are zoned CL, um, and those three parcels zoned CL have been zoned um, that way since 1998. Um, within the larger area, there are also several properties zoned specific plan um, as a result um, in the need for infrastructure as outlined in the Haynes Trinity plan, um, which we will dive into a little bit further as we look at the policy on the site. Um, the policy on the site is T4 Urban Neighborhood Center, um, which is... Uh, intended to create areas like it sounds, um, create a mix of uses um, that serve uh, the, the surrounding area um, for daily needs and services. Um, the proposed CL zoning is not expressly supported by this policy, but the policy guidance does state that other zoning districts um, than the ones listed in the policy may be appropriate. 
um, based on the locational characteristics um, surrounding context of the subject property and the ability of the applicant to document that the proposed zoning district is consistent with the policy. As the policy indicates, a design-based zoning, um, such as an SP, may be required to achieve planning objectives such as access management and coordination amongst other developments. In addition to uh, the uh, urban neighborhood center policy on the site. The site is also within um, the Haynes Trinity supplemental policy area. Um, a key component of this was with um, increase in intensity as called for within the plan. There was also an accompanying roadway network that was there to really support that increase in intensity. Um, and so what looks kind of confusing, but I, I tried to make it <laughs> look easy, is that uh, in the, the background we have really the whole area, so you can see the kind of road network that was envisioned with the whole area. Um, and then in the lower right-hand corner, um, kind of a zoomed-in portion of the site um, where the site is uh, circled, and we see a roadway connection come from the west over to Old Buena Vista Drive. Um, and so the, the site is located um, near the intersection of Old Buena Vista and West Trinity Lane, um, which are two uh, highly classified roads um, within the major and collector street plan. Um, additional intensity may be appropriate in the, at this site, um, given this factor and several others. Um, however, the policy designation um, the policy direction for the rezoning indicates um, this uh, intention for increasing the connectivity in order to support the rezoning. Um, and so a key component of the Haynes Trinity plan um, was that increase uh, in mobility. Um, the street rezoning as proposed does not include um, the, the needed right of way for the proposed road connection through the site. Um, as such, staff recommends disapproval of the requested rezoning. All right. Uh, we'll open this item for public as a disapproval. Uh, we'll open this item for public hearing. And is the applicant in the room? Applicant is not in the room. Anyone wishing to speak in support? Seeing none. Anyone wishing to speak in opposition? Seeing none. The councilman's not here and did not speak, so seeing no one else wishing to speak, I declare the public hearing closed. Um, commissioners, why don't we try this? It's, it doesn't meet the policy. Is there uh, a motion? Uh, Commissioner? Yeah. I move to um, accept staff's recommendation of disapproval. That's a proper motion. And second, any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor of disapproval, say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Ayes have it. It's disapproved. All right. So we are on to our last item, item 35. And so on this particular item, commissioners, Lisa, update us where we are in the procedure uh, on this. Certainly. Oops, Diana. Certainly. So this item was heard and presented to you at a previous planning commission meeting and it was ultimately deferred. Um, to allow time for the owners of the current owners of the property to have conversations with surrounding um, su surrounding neighbors, um, and also for us to have additional conversations related to um, the potential of plat of lot consolidation. Um, given the desires, and I know that they have been continuing to have, I know the owners have been continuing to have conversations with the community. There have not been any applications at this time for any um, lot consolidation. We are still um, with our recommendation of um, approval with conditions, um, given the um, other amendments that have taken place in the area to reduce the setback and um, the conservation policy on the site where the flatter areas are at the front. So I think that's probably that. And we had closed the public hearing, correct? The public hearing was closed. And so now we're just on discussion unless yes. we want to open the public hearing back up. Um, have I guess the question is, have there been any, hold on, Commissioner, have there um, been any updates 
different from anything that we heard last time, specifically? I don't believe that there have been any material changes. Um, I know that they, I know that the owners have had conversations with um, surrounding neighbors, but there have not been any material changes to the application. Okay, I think they're indicating that there has been some changes, Lisa. So maybe we should probably, I, Commissioner Johnson, did you have a question? I think the best way is maybe to. Yes, open the uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, I did recuse myself at the September meeting uh, for the interest of making a quorum. I will be sitting at the table, but I will recuse myself uh, from this discussion as well. Duly noted. And so, commissioners, it seems like there is some new information, and probably the best way to hear that would potentially be to open the public hearing back up so they can. But. So, what did you just say? Uh, it, since the, I think that in order to let the um, property owners speak, that the best way to let them speak is to open the public hearing, unless we ask them specific questions, like if there's an update without opening the public hearing. Alex, could we do that, or what is your... Yeah, you can certainly, you have the right to reopen public hearing whenever you want to. I think the question relates to, the, I'll go ahead and let you say it. Well, I, was, I didn't attend the last meeting that this was heard. So, I mean, I didn't, I was not a part of that. So if the public hearing is closed, then I would not be proper to vote on this item. So, commissioners, I think it, it because we have a quorum issue on this, it's, I think it, we need to open the public hearing back up. So is there a motion to open the public hearing? Second. There's a motion, second. Commissioner Hanley, did you second it? <laughs> <laughs> Your imaginary friend. <laughs> Commissioner Hanley seconds it. It means that it's yeah. so, the hand of the chair. Uh, I understand my role. All right, so we'll, we'll uh, all in favor of opening the public hearing back up, say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Ayes have it. We'll open the public hearing back up on item 35. So we'll do the presentation. Um, yes. Okay. We're going to do a bit of a tag team situation. Amelia's going to drive the slides, and I'm going to present um, in Abby's absence. Um, so this is item 35, Westmead Park, Inc. This is a request to amend a previously approved plat to reduce the platted setbacks. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions. Um, the existing zoning is RS40, single family, 40,000 square foot minimum lot size. Um, this is an amendment that proposes to reduce the platted setbacks on six existing platted lots along Carnivon Parkway. Um, the properties were platted as buildable lots as part of Westmead Park subdivision, which is a large subdivision. The setbacks on the platted lots range from 125 up to 150 feet. Um, this amendment proposes to reduce the setbacks to 70 feet. Um, this, there are a couple of different types of setbacks that we talk about, zoning required setbacks, which are either set as a standard or contextual, um, and then platted setbacks, which are really independent of zoning required setbacks. If the platted setbacks are greater than the zoning, the platted would govern. Um, it's, it was pr fa fairly common prior to the adoption of comprehensive zoning for plats to establish setbacks on the face of the plat. Um, the, cert, the general, the current subdivision regulations Regulations generally defer to the zoning code as it requires to set, to, to set back requirements. So this was a situation where we had lots that were platted prior to the existence of comprehensive zoning. And so we've got setbacks in place on the plats um, that exceed the zoning required setback. Um, there have been other amendments in the area. So the lots outlined, the lots with the red stars on them are the lots in question that where the request has been made to um, amend the setbacks. The green lot on each of the two plats is showing you where these two join together. So it's showing the larger Westmead Park subdivision. Um, there have been several um, amendments already to platted setbacks in this area to reduce them from 125 down to um, anything from, I believe, 58, if my, if my memory is serving me correctly, um, to 70 or 75. 
Um, so this is showing you where some amended setbacks have been on adjacent properties. Oh, it was 58. Look at that. So this is showing across the street on Carnivon property, I'm sorry, Carnivon Parkway, where the setbacks have been reduced um, from previously platted 125 plus setbacks. Um, so those, as you can see, where the houses are closer to the street, those are amended setbacks of adjacent properties to the properties in request. Um, this is an aerial showing the location. You can see where the houses, where the setbacks have been um, amended are sitting closer to the road. Um, and so staff recommendation is to approve of conditions as this is consistent with other amendments that have taken place. This also um, places the homes um, or places potential homes towards the front of the lot where the land is um, flatter and has less topography than as you move on the rear of the lots, the topography goes um, up. All right, anything else, Millie? You're good? We're good? She's good. Okay. All right, so we'll go ahead and open this, uh, open the public hearing. Um, applicants, you have 10 minutes. You can save two of the 10 minutes for rebuttal. Thank you. And state your name and address for the record. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Yep. All right. Uh, my name is Rebecca Cunningham. I live at 2014 12th Avenue South. That's my husband, Drew, right there. Um, thanks for being here today. Um, I would have brought some coffee for everyone if I had any idea. Um, so Drew and I own six lots, totaling 12 acres in a forested and hilly area in Westmead. We have plans to keep three of those lots, the three uh, that are along the cul-de-sac and build our dream home there. And you should have been passed out a map as well. Um, we have an update, a big one. Um, we've been lucky enough to find another couple with a similar dream to purchase our remaining three lots, which is something that was up in the air before. We can't afford to keep those three lots in the extra land ourselves, but with the amount of interest that we've gotten from developers throughout this process, finding Dan and Amy behind me here, a couple who wants to keep those multiple lots and just build one single home as well to retire in, felt almost too good to be true. When we first bought the land, we sent a handwritten card to everyone on the street, introducing ourselves, telling them our plan. We've made sure we met every single neighbor who lives up and down the street. There's only really five, so it was pretty easy. <laughs> but we have spent hundreds of hours out on this property using our own labor to clear the land of brush, invasive honeysuckle, and trash that has been dumped there for decades, and creating a hiking trail in the back. Uh, we have heard from just about everyone that it looks better than it has in 30 years. For liability, we needed to put private property signs on the site, but we stained wood and hand painted them so that they blend in with the forest and natural beauty, rather than putting up a bunch of plastic signs for our neighbors to be confronted by every day when they walk out their door. Some of our neighbors are building in addition in the back of their home and are currently excavating upslope in order to do that. They asked if they could drop the additional soil and rock on our land, and because we know we will probably need some fill dirt and rock at some point, but more importantly, because we wanted to be good neighbors, we said yes, saving them thousands in Holloway fees. At the start of this process, we sent another letter to everyone when we decided to request the setbacks be changed, explaining what we were doing and asking anyone with comments, questions, funny jokes to reach out. And we have done everything in our power to be the best neighbors anyone can ask for, even before living there. No one did reach out when we sent that letter. We assumed that meant that they thought the plan was completely reasonable. It is simply a request for our setbacks to be the same as theirs, after all. But apparently in the absence of a larger conversation, concern was whipped up through a tale about out of town developers swooping in to ravage the hillside and make a quick buck, destroying the neighborhood in the process. 
But as you can see, that could not be further from the truth. We have spent the last several weeks talking directly to as many of our immediate neighbors as possible, along with the Neighborhood Association and Councilman Druffel, <clears throat> clearing up the misconceptions and explaining our plans. We've offered to change the application, making the setbacks a little higher, or even taking some of the lots off of the plan. But the neighbors who spearheaded the former opposition told us no, that it was fine as is. What has been a really good takeaway for us, and something that many of you hinted at last time, is that we and all of the other neighbors want the same thing, to enjoy the beauty of this land, keeping it as natural as possible, building in as safe a way as possible, and with as few homes as possible. To disturb the least amount of the hillside, preserving the integrity of the soil, and maintaining space for more wildlife habitats, vitally important with the property backing up to some 200 acres of preserved land known as the Nashville Highlands. Frankly, with six adjacent lots around an acre or more apiece in a quiet cul-de-sac 10 minutes from downtown, with protected land behind it, and views of downtown at the top, we still can't believe we got to this property before a developer snapped it up. It was listed with no pictures and in the wrong location. We know we got lucky because we're hearing from so many developers who want this land now. Our realtor says when it was on the market, before Dan and Amy came in, it could have been as much as three to five a day. Two homes on 12 acres is the absolute best case scenario we and any of the neighbors could dream of here. Regarding the actual issue at hand, we're happy to report that not one neighbor is expressing opposition to the actual setback amendment that you're deciding today. I just asked a large group of them two days ago. and. Some uh, point blank this week that if there was any reason the setbacks to remain at 150 or 125, depending on the lot, no one had even one reason why they thought that would make more sense. In fact, some have asked if we could change the rear setbacks as well, forcing a build site lower on the property rather than simply allowing it. For reasons no one in planning, codes, or zoning who we've spoken with can fathom, this stretch of the street was platted in the 60s with setbacks between 125 and 150, forcing a home to be built all the way back of the lots and up the hillsides, with slopes, which slopes away from the street. Immediately, though, in the 60s, planning commissions began granting amendments because a build that high, especially on the steeper side lots, would require a builder to raise just about every tree between getting the equipment up the hill and preparing a build site. The older, larger trees are concentrated along the ridgeline and the upper third of the property. Ecologists consider them to be among some of the oldest in Nashville, up to 200 years old in some cases. There is no replacing them. Building that high would disturb an enormous amount of the natural hillside, which engineers also advise against for stability, and they would significantly reduce habitats for local wildlife in the process. We have a trail cam, and a, yes, I am that person that will pull out my phone and show anyone who seems even remotely interested all of the animals we have living on this property. Dozens of deer, wild turkeys, box turtles, several coyotes, recently something that looked a little cat-like, uh, but too bl blurry to fully make out. Out, along with the usual crew of squirrels and raccoons and the like. It's a paradise, and it's why we fell in love with this property. We don't want a builder to come in and destroy that. But without the setback change, they would be forced to. Building instead at a lower height and in a more shallow area is better for safety, stability of a future home, and is more in line with what we and all of our neighbors want and what they already have. I understand that when someone requests a change, especially for several lots at a time like this, the knee-jerk reaction is that this must be bad. But in reality, this is not a controversial decision. Unless we have a neighbor we don't know about who hates trees and is a big fan of less stable ground and more construction disruptions due to a more difficult build. We know after commissioning a feasibility study on the lots before we ever bought them, consulting with an engineering team and a geotechnical expert, that they will require safety measures like retaining walls, expert supervision, and stormwater mitigation, along with additional standards, paperwork, and codes to adhere to, to ensure a future home is solid and safe above the street level. 
Thankfully, there are requirements to ensure that, many of which have been put in place in the time since the other homes on the street were built. Building technology and techniques have also immensely improved since the 1960s, when I'm told developers couldn't even use computers to draft their plans, as just one example. With stronger codes, better techniques, and more knowledge today, our geotech expert pro proclaimed that the lots were buildable not just by legal standards, but practical ones. Mirroring the build site of all of our neighbors by combing out a flat spot halfway up the hill is a safer and more sustainable way to build. And let me make clear, no one cares more about a safe, safely built home than we do. Last meeting, many of you remarked how unique this case is. Unique because plats don't really include setbacks these days. Unique because this is not a new neighborhood, but one that's already established. But what I think is the most unique about this request is that by making this change, you will allow the street the ability to stay the same. How many people come up here every meeting begging you to keep the character and uniformity of their street intact? The adjacent homes, every home within viewing distance, and 15 of the 18 homes on the larger street all have setbacks within the range that we're just asking for today. The road turns before the dead end and uh, creates the feel of a new street, um, if you can see that with just five homes there. All five have received four on one side, one on the other, the exact same setback amendment. All we want is for our property, property to be in line with the neighborhood. For a home, especially on those one acre side lots, to not tower over the neighbors at the top of the hill feeling completely disjointed. Was that 10 minutes? It was. Wow. Okay. Time flies when you're having fun. So much fun. <laughs> Thank you very much. And so now anyone wishing to speak in support? Come on up. Two minutes. Guys, uh, thanks for sticking around late to uh, hear from us on this. Um, yeah, name and address. It. Name and address. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, name's Dan Stubbs. Uh, address is 1402 Emory Oak Cove in Laverne, Tennessee. Um, we are, uh, uh, obviously, we're, we're looking to buy these three lots, lots 86 through 88, um, uh, to, uh, as Rebecca said, to build our, our dream home. We, we started looking for undeveloped land and found this great spot and uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, love the neighborhood, love the way it looks, Don't, didn't want to disrupt that at all. Um, and so we, we made an offer, and, and we have a contract out that, that is contingent on, uh, you know, it being feasible for us to build there. Uh, so the first thing we investigated is, could we build with the current setbacks? Do we, do we, can we establish that it's feasible regardless? Uh, and we got a builder out there, and the first thing uh, he told us is, uh, yeah, pretty much no. I mean, it, it, it would be uh, totally prohibitive due to the amount of grading, uh, the getting the equipment up there, um, and the, the scale of the retaining walls that would be necessary when you're building up that high. There's not a lot of flat spot on top of that ridge. Uh, the way the property's shaped is you've got a, you've got a flat stretch, and then it's really steep, and... and it pretty much tops out up there. So uh, 70 feet puts us at about the right level to where we would be able to, um, you know, build uh, with a slight raise just like the rest of the, the neighborhood looks. Um, uh, and, and minimizing disruption to the hill and to the woods, which was one of the appealing things. We love the idea that we could, you know, live in the woods, uh, but be in the city and be close to things. Um, it's, it's not easy to find that trade-off. Um, so, um, uh, you know, I, I, I would just kind of uh, say we, we, we hope that you'll support this amendment. We think it's pretty equitable based on the map um, that the applicants just distributed. And uh, uh, well, for your support. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wish to speak in support? Hey guys, I'm Amy Stubbs. I live with that guy, 1402 Emory Oak Cove in Laverne. I want to also mention we were both born and raised in Nashville. Technically, he's Hendersonville, but I'm talking Paragon Mills, Norman Bankley, Rose Park, McMurray, Overton. We are Nashville through and through. I live in Laverne right now, guys. I want to get back home. <laughs> And it hasn't been affordable for a while. So we we love that um, we have found this beautiful property. Um, we 
would not likely be able to afford to build on it if it was at the setbacks that it's at right now. Um, it's like he said, the, the builder that we took up there was like, oh, you can, but it's going to cost you. And, and unfortunately, I don't, I don't know that we would be able to do that. And if we have to walk away from this deal, then some developer probably, probably would come in there who can afford to build way back where the setbacks are now and pop a bunch of houses up there. And we, I've been the Nashville Zoo photographer for 10 years. I love animals. I want to sit on my deck and look at the owls in the trees and photograph them and the chipmunks. I mean, all of it, you guys. So that's that's what we are really hoping to make this happen so we can stay in Nashville where we came from and have this beautiful property and be able to afford to build on it. Um, and we really do want to preserve the neighborhood. We love the neighborhood. We want to preserve it and minimize what comes down just to be able to pop our house in, in the middle, some, wherever it's safest, but probably the middle, and, and have trees all around us. And hopefully everyone would be happy. So thank you guys for staying so late and uh, for all your time. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? I'm going to be super quick because I know you guys have been here forever uh, like we have. So uh, Drew Cunningham, I live with Rebecca, obviously, uh, 2014 12th Avenue South. Um, I just think this is a best-case scenario. Like after our meeting, they came along, and it was just incredible, like, three lots and they just wanted to build one house and we just talked to developers and they're like oh yeah if we came out here we would we would just get up there and run a, a road along the ridge line and just drop houses off of it you know this that's how we would do it we'd probably put in a gate it would look really you know nice we'd make it look like a little you know hoa zone and it's just not what we wanted in the neighborhood so having that and having like us build one house, so two houses on 12 acres, disturbing as little as possible, I feel like is the absolute best case scenario that this property is gonna get. And if the setback doesn't get changed, then I'm not sure that that happens. So thank you guys. Thank you. Seeing no one else in support, anyone in opposition? Seeing none. And the councilman's not here. Uh, Councilman Dreffel was here last time. We had a very robust discussion. But seeing no one else wishing to speak, I declare the public hearing closed. Vice Chair, we've circled around. Okay. Um, I really, it has been a long time. Um, what Was the council person in favor or in opposition? He, 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 I think he was um, in opposition, but I, I think we had a robust conversation. So this is what I recall. And then we can build off of this maybe. Um, is I, I remember a lot of angry citizens, including um, the councilman being not supportive of it, um, thinking that it was going to be six houses right. built. And that was really, I don't think, the intention of the owners. And so I think that they, it sounds like to me, they've really worked hard and took our comments at heart. Um, you know, personally, I, I love the, I always am about certainty, um, especially for the neighbors. And so if, if um, I, I have asked uh, the director um, to, find out if, if it's allowable to have that as a condition that only these two houses be built on this 12 point acres and I believe that's correct. Director, do you want to comment on that? So there seemed to be two different sets of issues. One was doing the all six at the same time. There were some questions there. And then as expressed by the applicants, they only wanted to do the one house and then sell the other three. And so now they have an update here. Um, what I would say is um, I did speak to the applicant about consolidation. I think they're open to it. They had some questions about rules around accessory units and things like that um, and so I would just put that on the table and you can certainly ask them their plans but I think if we we have the option to recommend consolidation as a condition of the setback um, I think that um, it's possible that, that there would be some constraints around an accessory units. Um, and so I, at that point, um, said you need to research that further, um, and perhaps that would be a reason for a deferral, for example, just so that we, you would know and we would know, because what I don't want to do is get out in front of 
you know, someone who wants to fully understand what they can do on their property. But we can, um, as a condition of approval of the plat of the setbacks, um, require that as a condition. And, um, and so that's, they just had some questions, I would say, on, on what that would mean for them and their single family home that I understand they want to build a single family in there. So we could require, I mean, I, I think that this, I've, I've thought since from the beginning, the 70 foot setbacks made sense. I mean, mm -hmm. do not need to disrupt a steep slope. <laughs> right. Um, so it, it makes sense. Um, and it does sound like the best possible outcome to get two homes there. Would we put a condition that the lot consolidation was a requirement or that we want them to explore it further? Can, I mean, like, what's the... These are subdivisions where you, where we have a quasi or amendments to a subdivision where we have a quasi-judicial role. It's not like rezoning where I think you, you could put some soft language in there. Um, and so I think that um, you could certainly ask the applicants to restate their intent. The chairman's correct, and as I explained to them today, you can say you're only going to do a single family home and I have no reason to just to right. doubt them um, but the land development as it is today still has six lots mm -hmm. and so you know I do think there's a there's a f um, fewer or no no I'm pointing to a, <laughs> an empty gallery there. <laughs> uh, they've clearly done some work with their neighbors and so um, you know, um, perhaps some of the early concerns around number of lots and things has been a bit, has been addressed. So, well, I, you know, I think I would be, be thinking back to the public hearing and the and because of the staff, we did indicate that the public hearing would be closed, recognizing we always have the authority to reopen it. So, um, but just in case that led to some confusion, I think that you know, two homes on that would be a very best case scenario for that entire neighborhood. And so I think that I would be in support of adding that as a condition, but I'm certainly open to what the rest of my commissioners think. Commissioner Blackshear. I would be fine with that condition, um, but I do recognize what you were saying, Director, about giving the um, property owners and potential property owners time to figure out what that would mean for them. Um, and I, I'm, I'm assuming you guys have not done any diligence to figure out if that would restrain you in a way. It was a couple hours ago. So... <laughs> um, so um, I would be in favor of it, but I would also be in favor of the property owners um, having the ability to research what that meant for them. Councilman? Boy, do I remember that public hearing, and I'm sure the applicants do too. Um, I think one of, the, one of the questions that I'd had about uh, applying uh, a uniform setback on this site is that you have six lots that each have slightly different configurations, and then obviously the topography can change. I'm assuming, I mean, I don't, I don't have an objection to it per se, but that was one of the questions that I, at least I had in my mind is, it, it, is it better at 50 foot at one lot and, you know, something at another one? But I, I think we're at the point, we, we just are where we are, and definitely 70 is better than, you know, 125 or 150. So. Uh, that is what it is, uh, but um, but I'm there. One of, uh, in terms of accessory uses or accessory buildings, I, I, are we, are what we're talking about? Would that be like day dues or outbuildings with residential units? So I, at the last planning commission meeting, upon hearing the feedback, said that we would have a discussion about consolidated. Mm -hmm. Um, lots based on my understanding of what the applicant was was doing. So the commission sort of alerted the interest on that when, I, when, when the case was initially heard. Um, when we followed up with them today to see, you know, what, you know, where they were, um, I came to understand that there might be an interest in building a small accessory building. I don't want to speak for the applicant. And so when I heard that, I um, 
said, well, that wasn't what our understanding was. It doesn't mean that's bad or wrong, um, but I think, you know, you, we need to understand if you're going to have one lot, what the requirements would be under the zoning. And so that's that's where I left it. Um, Lisa's, um, would the applicants have an option of, um, would tell me what the options would be if the commission were to recommend such a condition? Um, Cer certainly. So I, I think that we would want them to talk through the proposal that they have with codes to understand what's permitted by the zoning code um, because you are allowed to have accessory buildings, um, pool houses, those sorts of things. I just am not sure about sort of the classification of, of like a guest house or something. So I think we would have to have that conversation with codes. Um, if you all were to recommend approval with conditions and the condition was that um, the three lots around the cul-de-sac be consolidated and that the other three lots be consolidated. And then for some reason there was, um, that created some hardship and you could set sort of a timing of like prior to building permits or whatever. And if that created a hardship, um, that they could then reapply to ask for that condition to be removed. I mean, that is something that could then come back to the planning commission for further discussion. I guess that's a little bit of what I was going into is like a, uh, accessory, you, some accessory buildings are used, but like a day do would not be used because it has RS zoning, right? So that, I mean, that's kind of what I'm, what I'm getting to a, a little bit. And also just to confirm if we, I think this is true, we just want to confirm. So if we did place a condition of lot consolidation, that would not be, that would not trigger the other requirements of like a, a lot subdivision. Is that correct? consolidation uh, plats. I mean, it would be a separate application, but those are generally administratively approved um, because you're going from three to one, and so consolidation plats are, are typically something that's reviewed at the staff level. And so, but it wouldn't trigger the current um, lot subdivision requirements and and things like that. Oh, no, 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 not on a consolidation. Consolidation are sort of a separate yeah. category. Um, if you're going from more to less, then it's not a conservation subdivision or whatever. That's just creating new lots. You wouldn't actually be creating new lots. You'd be You wouldn't be creating two new lots. You'd yeah. be subtracting right. lots. Got it. I, I thought that was true, but just wanted to be clear. So I'm a, I mean, personally, I'm a little bit hesitant about um, uh, adding new restrictions at this point because I, uh, I think it's a good idea, but I also feel like the applicants have done a lot of diligence uh, to this date and have pretty much done everything that we've really conditioned them to do. So myself, I'll be willing to hear from my fellow commissioners, though, on that. So, Mr. Henley. Um, I'm just glad you guys found somebody that fits in with the, you know, the overall um, plan you had envisioned. Um, you know, I've, I commended you all last time you were here for just the level of engagement that you had and really thinking through what you wanted and being persistent um, in, in the way you handled things. I, I mean... I support, you know, the recommendation that was before us, but I was at that point last time. I've not heard anything to change my stance. So we do need a, a motion. We could, <laughs> if you've this, been this convinced. Is a warm, this is a pretty warm chair. Um, well, I would, I would make a motion to approve staff recommendation. That's a proper motion. Is there a second? Second. There's a second. Any other discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed no, ayes have it. All right, so thanks, y'all, for your patience. Thank you for coming in. We appreciate it, and I'm sorry for the long meeting, but um, very much appreciate it. And, and hopefully you guys have seen a process that works, but it, it can be cumbersome, so yeah. thank you. Thank you guys for being here. Thank you. All right, so we're on to other business. Uh, historic. No report on historic parks. No, no, no parks report. Executive committee is that we're just um, going to work on uh, a workshop for the tree ordinance. But we're also entering the phase of the year where we only have one meeting per month, right? 
Yes, and so I told the council lady, well, this, the team has told the council lady that we would make every effort to meet her timeline, but with the holidays and our meeting schedule, it, you know, it, it, I mean, it can be difficult. So if we move into, I don't think that there's a hard deadline to pass her ordinance before the end of the year that something the boogeyman would get us or anything. But I do believe she is very interested in, in passing it. So, Councilman, I, I know I, it's a commit. We try to do the best we can this time of year. And I know, I know Councilor Murphy understands that. Um, Director, do you have anything? Thank you for your service. <laughs> Councilman, any legislative update? Nope, no legislative. So seeing no other business before the commission, is there a motion to adjourn? We're adjourned. <laughs>been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again or for more information on this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.